welcome to Kurt Vonnegut. It's the podcast dedicated to the life and works and ongoing things of Kurt Vonnegut because he's the greatest author of all time. My name is Alex Schmidt, and I'm joined as always by my co-host, Michael Swain. You. Yeah. Welcome, Alex. No one ever welcomes you. Oh, hey, I appreciate it. You listeners do not <laughs> appreciate Alex enough. <laughs> Welcome, Alex. Right. Why aren't you guys breaking into the show? Yeah, I apologize on behalf of our rude, rude listeners. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just kidding. We love you guys. Uh, this is, uh, I, that, that felt a little meta almost. I feel like that's a good fit for today's book. Today's book is Time Quake, written I wasn't in 1997. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding about not being kidding. 1997, uh, Time Quake, topic what a of the year. day. Yep. What a year. And this is uh, the last Kurt Vonnegut novel, sort of, but also sure. I feel like it's not totally a novel either, which we can get into in a segment called Plot Time. Coming at you hard and fast. Oh, yeah. Plot time oh, yeah. is going to tell you about the cast of the book and what they did, because that's the plot. That's <laughs> unst. <laughs> yeah, that was, of all the beats I could have given yes. you, that is the weakest one. As a great DJ once said, unst, 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 unst. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very like like uh, older comedian trying to figure out what the rap is. There was a period where that me. was the standard onomatopoeia for house music, was yeah. like O-O-N-S-T, unst, unst, unst. <laughs> <laughs> but now you got to have a beat drop in there, or it doesn't sound authentic. Oh, yeah, the dubstep move. Yeah. <laughs> Bow. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, when you start grinding, kids. <laughs> kids still say grinding, right? I what are kids, <laughs> man? I don't know anything. Uh, this is a, a segment all about the various things that happen in the book, and oh. this one is a book that I had read before when I was much younger. So it's been a lot of time since I read it again, and this time it felt like. There's not a novel there. It's another mm. essay collection, and also there are some novel elements, and also there's just some like meta stuff. Not that uh, that's bad. It's just a really interesting construction for a book. I, I don't think that's bad. I feel like something we've learned about Vonnegut's overall oeuvre through the course of this journey together yeah. is, uh, I mean, first of all, you learn the things that he likes to do as an artist that repeat themselves. You know, you can you can do that with anyone. A lot of After Hours episodes come from that. Like, <laughs> oh, Joss Whedon loves magical, chaotic, neutral girls like River Tam. Yeah. And there's going to be one in every story he tells. What does that mean? You can make up a bunch of conspiracy theories about it. And I think we've uncovered some of the things Vonnegut does. And... I think a unique way he finds to refresh his formula is to try something wacky structurally. Like we saw the one, and he only he only does it once. We saw the book where he has like parentheticals to the point where it's a structural choice because there's a parenthetical every sentence. Yeah. Um, and then he never did that again. And this one is, I think, the most interesting of his structural choices. So I underscore what you said. It's not bad that it's not a novel. It's really experimental in a way I think is pretty cool. It's three different drafts. Well, it's two drafts of a novel plus essays about what, like, again, Dave Barry-ish, just musings <laughs> about what he thought about life in his 70s yeah, and what he thought about not finishing the novel, blah, 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 is part of the novel. Right. Right. So there's three different timelines going on, and I and one of them's real and two are fake. And I just think it's a really cool way to re-energize his formula. Because when you strip away that structural stuff, his formula is still in place heavily. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. It's another rehashing one. <laughs> There's a lot of lines that are quoted from his own work at this point. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there are whole... Because this is broken into a lot of little chapters, which he hasn't done in a bit. And it's a lot of, like you say, uh, repeating himself, mm -hmm. honestly. like I And I don't know if it's... When I, I remember reading it the first time and being more into it, this time I was not that into it. I think just because we've so carefully gone over all his previous work. So it's I'm very, very conscious of the repetition. Like, I can't get past it. <laughs> yes, the repetition becomes egregious only if you just read every other Kurt Vonnegut book in right. order. Which, right. right. <laughs> it wouldn't be a problem if you picked one up at random. Just like if you didn't obsessively watch every Quentin Tarantino movie in order – you wouldn't notice he has a foot fetish. It wouldn't bother you. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. It takes, so, like, I'm not trying to turn people off of reading it because I read it 
out of way out of order, like just randomly in the midst of reading other stuff. Yeah. And loved it. Right. And but now I see how repetitious it is because of this podcast. So thanks a lot, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> It's uh, because of me. Yeah. Um, it was me. <laughs> All right. So let's get into what actually happens. Yeah. So there's, like we were saying, there's a few layers to it. And this is also a book that Vonnegut's previous novel was Hocus Pocus in 1990. Mm-hmm. And then this comes out in 1997. So during that time, a lot of things happen in his life. And one of them is he takes a couple stabs at writing this book. And so there's uh, what he calls, and, and right in the intro, this book is also sort of the podcast episode about itself because he gives you a lot of background and a lot of like, yeah. oh, I tried to do this and that with it. And he wrote what he calls Time Quake 1, which is a basic novel story that there are elements of in this. And then this book that we receive is Time Quake 2 because it's that basic novel story, plus a bunch of Trout stuff, plus a bunch of Vonnegut musings, plus just this overall stitching together of the dog's breakfast that he has. Yes, Dog's Breakfast being part of the lexicon in this book, that's what he calls human brains. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Um, maybe let's look at uh, Timequake 1, like the basic story. Okay, yeah, split uh, it out that way. Yeah. Oh, and that's another tactic, of course, that we've uncovered, is that he develops a lexicon for every book, and he loves repeating unique phrases until they have deep meaning and then deploying them at the perfect time. Yeah. And, yeah, so like Dog's Breakfast comes back over and over in this, and Ting-a-ling is the like so it goes or you know of this novel but time quake one so i guess time quake two refers to the overall book that you are reading holding in your hands yeah yeah time quake one's the rough draft that he intended and then the additional material is just additional material yeah um <laughs> time quake one is the only one with a story like a like yeah. a story story that you could make into a movie and it follows kilgore trout finally Ah. Getting a run as protagonist of one of the novels. <laughs> the last one. I guess one. that's true. Yeah, he's a major character in a couple of them, but he's never quite the protagonist. Yeah. Yeah, I guess in uh what it's not slapstick. What's the one where well, he's driving across country with Breakfast the truck? of Champions? In Breakfast, like, yeah, the most but still as a character probably. It's yeah. Dwayne Hoover's story yeah. though, for sure. And he's like a minor character ish in Galapagos, because it's about his it's like his son narrating people's adventures and he comes through a tunnel in it. But and, I didn't but, even know that until retrospect. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You um, know you don't think of it as him. But yeah. uh, but in this so one, this he, he's the hero. Yeah. Yeah. So such as he is, and, uh, <laughs> it's about a time quake, which I think is an awesome concept. It's great. It's uh, where the world is just proceeding as normal, and then on February thirteenth, two thousand and one, which when Vonnegut is writing this is the future. In February thirteenth, two thousand one, the universe stops expanding and thinks about doubling back. And so all of time moves back to February seventeenth, nineteen ninety one, which is just short of ten years back. And then from there, everyone has to relive everything they did, just observing it from their own bodies for the almost 10 years. Because the universe, as Vonnegut describes it, kind of says, uh, you know, I thought about going back, but never mind. I'm just going to keep going forward. And so time just catches up again with everyone doing everything they did over. So you can't not do what you did before, but you are aware that you're doing it again. Yeah. So it's indistinguishable from, technically, if everyone on the world suddenly had very powerful deja vu for 10 years. Yeah, right. It's indistinguishable. Like, there's no way to tell which is actually (laughs) happening. But in the book, he, the narrator, as God, tells you that it's that time skipped back 10 years. So you're trapped in your body, like in being John Malkovich, just doing this stuff. What I think is funny is I'm pretty sure I found some paradoxes and mistakes and contradictions based on revisions. Like the fact that it's three (laughs) revisions put together. For example, one time and only one time at the clam bake, he refers to Monica Pepper Vonnegut, his wife. Right. But there's no other mention of him having married her, and it's unclear whether he means... In real life, he's predicting that he will divorce his real life wife, Jill, and marry a fictional character. <laughs> yeah. Or if he accidentally left that in from a previous revision where somehow Vonnegut from Timequake married Monica Pepper, because that doesn't happen in the book. <laughs> yeah. And so it's like, it's odd. There's also, because he says by definition that he can only write words that he wrote before, right? Because it's a Timequake. So he's going back in time, and the book that you are reading is a book that he's written twice. Yet, in the book... He's describing the time quake and living through it a second time, which he couldn't have 
written, if that makes sense, it's a classic time travel paradox. He could not have written a book yeah. about going back in time if the <laughs> definition of time travel is you can't deviate from what you did the first time. Because then why was he writing a book about going back in time when he didn't go back in time yet? <laughs> Etc. Yeah. I had to get that out of the way. Now That's we, great. Yeah. That's great, man. Yeah. Well, and because also in past interviews he's said like of course you know everything i say is horse shit and uh, time travel doesn't work he's aware of that yeah, yeah. <laughs> and in the, pro in the prologue at one point he says that he messes with where because kurt vonnegut is a character in the book too it's sort of like breakfast of champions where trout is a character and also vonnegut is a character and yet sometimes he's also saying now cut to me really me the real me right. writing observations for example my older brother bernie is dying of cancer and that's true really true now, me, Vonnegut, in the story, <laughs> interacts with Trout, who is also, let's be honest, Vonnegut. Yeah. And this and he, happens. And you're like, what is real? <laughs> well, and, he, and he says in the prologue that within this book that you're reading, there's going to be parts where he, Kurt Vonnegut, is in 2001. There's parts where he, Kurt Vonnegut, is in 2010. And then there's parts where he, Kurt Vonnegut, is in 1996 when he's really writing it. He says that he writes this prologue in November of 1996. Right. And he says, like I must be nuts is the direct quote. Oh, he quote. must be. Like it's just he's just not even because you can even out. subdivide it. The Kurt Vonnegut in two thousand one is sometimes a real Kurt Vonnegut writing <laughs> about the book he's writing, and is sometimes a fictional Kurt Vonnegut who's writing about being trapped in a rerun, which didn't obviously really happen to real Kurt Vonnegut. Right. It's crazy yeah. he's nuts <laughs> <laughs> and in the uh, in the basic basic story sure. in the that plot, they tried plot, to make a book yeah. uh, or that he tried to make a book the time quake happens and so everyone catches back up to february 13th 2001 when it originally happened and then free will kicks back in but everyone's gotten used to not having free will for close to 10 years and so if someone is driving a car they just keep driving off it off the road into a river or into a building in most cases if someone's yeah. flying they tend to the plane tends to just crash because they're just sitting there kind of on autopilot <laughs> not literally uh -huh. and Unfortunately uh, not. and then trout it had been living in a homeless shelter next to the American Academy of Arts and Letters. That is a real place on 155th Street, way up north in Manhattan. Well, but, also they say the homeless shelter is what used to be the Museum of the American Indian, yeah. which Vonnegut is predicting, like, I guess, as a commentary on how we don't respect Native American culture so deeply, that soon they, even that museum will be gone. But that's not true. That's not true. My yeah. girlfriend and I just went there, and it's awesome, oh. and all the proceeds go to the tribes. So that's pretty cool. Oh, I've or never at least been. heartening that that prediction didn't come true. It's a beautiful museum, yeah. Cool. Because yeah. Yeah, all this stuff's visitable. It's in all in one yeah. complex. But it's funny that in 96, Vonnegut was like, that won't even be here by 2001. <laughs> yeah. Because it's too nice, but it is still there. Well, there's also, and like we said, any continuity or canon in this book is real loose. But at yeah. one point, he's, he talks about the ruins of Columbia University being in 2001, which is, that's still well, university. Yeah. He had just uh, played so Fallout it's... 4 and misinterpreted <laughs> it. Yeah. So it's a, so it's a slightly dystopian or at least America's starting to crumble situation and then the time quake ends and Kilgore Trout through a few different hijinks and just strokes of luck manages to survive it and then he and a couple of other characters who we'll talk about leave the American Academy of Arts and Letters and go upstate to a writer's retreat called Xanadu and then after that there's a big clam bake where Trout and Vonnegut meet Everyone that Trout, but really Vonnegut, has known in life. And then there's like kind of a retirement speech for Kurt Vonnegut it's as a writer. It's the Seinfeld writer. series finale, basically. Yeah, <laughs> it's a very, it's like just Soup a Nazi wrap -up. comes back. The Sirens of Titan come back. Newman yeah. comes back. Everyone you wanted to see. <laughs> <laughs> Sirens, Jerry. Yeah, it's all, yeah. yeah. That was sort of Jerry talking to Jerry. I, I apologize. But yeah, it's, uh, I was a victim of accidents. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and then and that's uh, like there's a few other characters to talk about. There's Sorry. Monica Pepper, who you mentioned, is like running the academy, and then her husband Zoltan Pepper is uh, paralyzed from the waist down, and then is also 
killed in a car crash when the time quake ends because they don't know where they're driving. Trout would have been out there, but a smoke alarm went off. Whoa, and whoa, whoa, stuff whoa. About him You're being... Russian, man. <laughs> it's very, because it's like, it's very loose and there's not a lot there plot wise. Well, I but feel it's... like an easy way to wrap your head around it, if I may. Yeah, yeah. Would be the quick backgrounds of each of the characters because there aren't even that many. Yeah, sure. Um, So there's like, Monica and Zoltan Pepper, they work at the Academy. Their whole plot line is basically they have a conversation, a classic <laughs> Vonnegut conversation about player piano, basically, about how automation is ruining them. Yeah. Uh, Zoltan just found out that there's a new program that does, uh, what is it, composes music just as well as him. He yeah. was a composer. He's a composer, and you can just use the program to plug in what you want, right. and it's done. And and his, there's a version of that for architecture and other And his stuff. older brother yeah. committed suicide because he was an architect who got replaced by a program that does architecture. Um, she dove into their pool and accidentally hit him, which paralyzed him from the waist down, and, quote, makes his ding-dong not work. <laughs> and uh, they talk about that. Then the time quake happens. They do everything they did for 10 years. Then when the time quake unhappens, Zoltan is outside ringing the doorbell to try to get in in his wheelchair, and a truck hits him, as Alex said, and Monica interacts with Trout and helps save the neighborhood. Boom. Reset. <laughs> Dudley. Dudley is a guard at the, yeah. at the Arts Institute of Arts and Letters. His plot line is... He was, uh, and I think this is good social commentary, he's an innocent person who was nevertheless convicted for the rape and murder of a young girl and spent like eight years in jail before he was exonerated by DNA evidence. Now he's a guard at this place. Uh, he sees through the peephole that Trout always throws his uh, short stories as soon as they're done, he throws them in a garbage can. Yeah. And because he sees this happen over and over, he thinks they must be like a sign from God who he found in jail. He discovered Jesus. Uh, he reads one of Trout's short stories out of the garbage can. Then, boom, time quake hits. <laughs> he goes back and has to relive being in prison for a crime he didn't commit, finding Jesus again, going on talk shows, becoming a guard at this place. When the time quick unhappens, he's there guarding the place, but he doesn't unfreeze because he has, which Alex alluded to, what has become a global phenomenon, post-time quake apathy, yeah. which is a unwillingness to unfreeze either because you're so used to not having to make decisions or you don't want to start again because it seems scary now after 10 years of autopilot. Yeah. Trout comes in, manages to rouse him. He joins the group who helps save the community. And by save the community, we just mean they go around and round people up and wake them up and make them stop, you know, and tend to the wounded and shit. But because Trout was the first person in America able to do that, he's like a national hero. Yeah, he uh, because he says a line which is one of the most famous lines in the book, one of the best parts, which is, you were sick, but now you're well and there's work to do. Yes, and which Trout says that to Dudley Prince, motto. and Dudley is like, "Oh, I get it." And he says it to a couple people, and they say it to a couple people, and it becomes known as Kilgore's Creed because it's sort of a mantra that wakes people up again. And it was eventually broadcast on national news, and that's how they got most people to wake up. Yeah, because he first tried saying, "The time quakes over; you have free will," and that's too abstract. <laughs> so then, to Dudley, he was like, "You had a brain fever that made you crazy, but you're out of the coma now," and that he was like. Oh, okay. Like he could buy it. So right. then he he generalized that too. Now you go out and just tell people they've been sick, but it's over now. And a bunch of people are hurt, so we have to help them. And that got generalized to what Alex just said, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Boom, reset. The only other character I think to talk about is Trout himself, yeah. who is a bum who writes a bunch of short stories and throws them away. Then the time quake happens. He doesn't give a shit because he already thought life was a crock of shit and free will was an illusion. <laughs> so when free will is reinstated, he rolls with it really easily, goes around, is a good Samaritan, helps people, wakes up other people, expands the community, extended family, Vonnegut trope, and uh, helps save people. As Alex said... Society's crumbling, so they all go to a clam bake to have a nice break. I think it's important to note that the clam bake is a cast party for a production of a play about Abraham Lincoln, yeah. which from a very early draft of Time Quake, there was this whole convoluted plot where John Wilkes Booth sires an illegitimate son with one of Lincoln's like daughters who ends up so that a descendant of Booth ends up playing Lincoln in a play. It doesn't matter. Trout gives yeah. a bunch of nice speeches at the clam bake. Everyone recognizes Trout as a talented writer and great man for the first time in his whole bitter life as a bum. He dies. The end. 
I think that's the whole plot. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Great. Yeah, and, and All it, right. And it is it is really interesting that he almost went down that blind alley of like a bunch of Booth Lincoln stuff, like uh, John Wilkes Booth and Abraham Lincoln, and like oh somehow Booth's descendants play Lincoln in a play, but who knew? And like oh what a country, you know. It, I don't like hate it or anything. It just wouldn't have made yeah. any sense. <laughs> oh, and in there we get because it's so digressive that it's just like little vignettes. So that's why the plot's so simple, and yet the book is book length. But mixed in there, we get the most, I think, the most Trout stories ever that yeah. are fully fleshed out. Well, Plus, it, like you just said, descriptions of directions the book could have gone that he didn't do. Yeah. It's like, so it becomes very confusing. <laughs> there are multiple endings that you know, and then one that he deems like, but this one really happened. But you just said a different one that could have equally happened. It's weird. Yeah, that's true. And because it, it, well, also there's the most trout stories at least hinted at. Not all of them are fully fleshed out. A lot of them are just it, Vonnegut saying, as Trout says in X short story, here's a quote from it. And that's all you get. Like you just get either an untitled story or the title of a story. And then he hits, this is a quote I think is great, that just would have been in the Trout story. Like they, there's just some that are not even totally put together to the extent yes. that a Trout story usually is. But for the record, <laughs> <laughs> I would encourage you reading it if you like cool sci-fi short stories because you get the sisters b36 joy's pride an unnamed story that's one of the coolest ones about a summit of all the elements of the periodic table yeah that's great dr yeah. schadenfreude bunker bingo party albert <laughs> hardy the guy with a dick for a head golden <laughs> wedding dog's breakfast my 10 years on autopilot which is trout's novel about the time quake right there's also that book that exists within, the, within book. the novel yeah the short story empire state the play, The Wrinkled Old Family Retainer, the poem, the very brief poem, Tupelo, and, <laughs> uh, and an unnamed short story about a planet called Puke that orbits a sun the size of a BB. <laughs> yeah. And, there, and I think there's there's at least one other... It, it's, Did I miss one? There, well, there's one. It's an untitled story that feels like a joke about trout stories where it's untitled and he just says it's about one-eyed green aliens who only get food if they sell goods or services to others everybody starves to death because they run out of sales ideas that's oh, the entire right. story it's yeah. like a joke about trout famador being earth like it's just it's yeah. the laziest approach to that possible and trout writes it up like yeah it's like vonnegut parody like, himself. Uh, it's trail from Medora, but it's capitalism it doesn't work anyway moving on like we're right it would be like, like if he synopsized <laughs> the story that was like a bunch of male characters in their late 60s yeah. <laughs> kill themselves by drinking bleach. The end. You'd be like, yeah, we get it. You know what you do. Right. They're all World War II veterans. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh... <laughs> and one's yeah. named Bernard P. O'Bear. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and there, and then other threads in this from Vonnegut's life, he talks about in real life that Bernard Vonnegut dies in 1997 of incurable cancer. Shortly before he wrote some end. parts of this novel. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there's also... Well, the epilogue is like a, a epistle to Bernie. What do you call it? Right. Uh, eulogy. Yeah. The epilogue is basically a eulogy for his brother, yeah. Yeah, his brother who we've talked about in... A lot of the episodes of the show, like even back to Player Piano, he's he, a huge influence yeah. on it. And he gave us Ice Nine, like we wouldn't have Cat's Cradle without his inspiration. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And then in the meantime, he he talks a lot about Vonnegut talking about himself. Like he's very fixated on his age, and he talks about like other artists getting into their fifties and beyond, and whether or not they could produce anything good. And you see him in this book and his letters at the time, he's super fixated on like. Oh, my father stopped functioning in his mid fifties. Hemingway wrote "Old Man at the Sea" in the sea at age fifty three, and then he was done. Like it's a yeah. lot. It's very now, yeah. specifically Kurt Vonnegut retiring. Sure, like, yeah. Now done. that my older brother's dead, generationally, it's my turn to die next. Yeah. What, what, what's that going to be like? Blah blah blah. Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot about his family and the kids. Inter I w did look up Steve Adams, his nephew, he keeps referring to as a comedy writer. I was like, I had to know. The most notable thing he wrote, do you remember that movie Envy with Jack Black and Ben Stiller? Yeah, did he write that? Kurt Vonnegut's nephew wrote the screenplay. I've seen, I saw that. It's just That's odd, amazing. odd fun fact. Yeah. <laughs> and several other movies that look good that I was not aware of, but I'm like, they look fine. <laughs> People I'm aware yeah. of are in them. Yeah. That, oh, wow. It's just amazing that someone Kurt Vonnegut raised 
wrote lines for Jack Black to say to Ben Stiller. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Pretty I mean, cool. Yeah, because they yeah because he had they had three biological children and then raised three children. Steve Adams is um, his name, and right? then he also adopted a daughter with his second wife. Right, Jill, Soon so Ye there's... was her name. <laughs> no, <Wait>, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, her name is Lily. Oh. And uh, she also, she's also. I think we found in a previous episode. She's a like a working actress. Like she's around Hollywood. Ah. Yeah, she's doing voice parts right now. And yeah, yeah, busy. She did change her name to Gwyneth Paltrow. But... <laughs> <laughs> Every celebrity was raised by Kurt. Bonnet. Well, she changed her name to Chris Kattan, and that Show didn't exclusive. work out eventually. And then she switched it to Gwyneth. <laughs> it was a conscious uncoupling from the name Chris Kattan. Right, Mango. I Vonnegut. am on fire right now. A <laughs> Mango Vonnegut. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, um, yeah, me eating this apple and spitting it on you is a symbol for humanity. <laughs> <laughs> it all makes sense. Yeah. And yeah, and then the rest of the book is a lot of like it's it's almost it read as more of an essay collection to me this time around. Like it's it's almost not a novel. Like it's an essay collection with really heavy trout short stories and a time quake concept that could have been a trout short story that he just tried to blow out. I think if you put all the time quake parts together that are narrative, it would be a novella. It's a yeah, novella maybe. expanded yeah. to book length with essay parts. But when you say that, I think the knee jerk is to think that that's lazy. I don't think it was lazy. I think it's highly experimental and kind of cool, personally. Yeah, it is. It's definitely experimental. And if I, like we said, if we hadn't made this show, I think I would enjoy it more. <laughs> it's sure. Like, it's like tough just having yeah. read a lot of these sentiments recently. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's pretty much the plot of the book. So let's get into the nitty gritty of all these great thoughts in it with a segment called Kurt Blurt. 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 <laughs> what? Oh, so guttural. Uh, there's a. I think there are a lot of great blurts in this one. Some of them are oh, yeah. repeats from the past, and some of them are new and very, very, very exciting. I have a lot, so I'm glad we got through plot time quicker than usual, so there's time for lots of blurts. Yeah, it's it's so meta there's uh, and so essay-based. There's very little plot, yeah. And yet, yeah, so se- I think lines out of context are almost better for yeah. this book yeah, than, yeah. than the plot. Other than the central concept of the time quake, which is endlessly cool. Yeah, there's. I have one short. It's a thing that Trout used to describe the end of the time quake, and he says... Only when free will kicked in again could they stop running obstacle courses of their own construction. Ooh. I just really like that description of it. Yeah. Yeah, he has lots of good descriptions in this one. Speaking of which, one of the very first things you see is an illustration. Do you want to save that for Vana Art? Yeah, we can, there's only a couple, but we can save it. All right, for we'll Art. save it. Yeah. We'll save it. Fine. Then I switch my answer to, <laughs> quote, I heard the poet Robert Pinsky give a reading this summer in which he apologized didactically for having had a much nicer life than normal. I should do that, too. I appreciate the perspective and... I could not think of that Simpsons episode where Lisa <laughs> hears a Robert Pinsky rating. No? Oh, and the jocks are know. there and they're like, Basho, dude. Banana tree. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> I don't know. I don't really, I don't know Robert Pinsky. So, yeah. uh, his most notable work is Basho, which is really good. <laughs> Uh, but they just have like a bunch of guys who would be at a football game, right? Who have like their chest painted. And they're like, yeah, dude, Pinsky. <laughs> Read my show. <laughs> I love how the Zipsons works in stuff like that so often. Like when they're chanting Bart and Fink for their first R-rated movie. That's how you first learned That's about Bart great. and Fink, right? Yeah, Prop yeah. Me too, yeah. <laughs> and it became so much funnier when you were old enough to see Bart and Fink and realize <laughs> Kids would fucking hate it. It's boring as hell. That's what's funny about it. Yeah. <laughs> Barton Fink. <laughs> uh, but more Kurt stuff that came out of his dumb mouth. <laughs> yeah. This actually, this is kind of bouncing off myself now that that wasn't a great question. Uh-huh. But uh, it's Trout talking about the significance of the time quake. And he says, listen, if it isn't a time quake dragging us through knot hole after knot hole, it's something else just as mean and powerful. Yeah. Uh, which is because that, that time quake concept is so good. And part of me wishes Vonnegut had gone ahead and written the whole book. Like, it, like just gone ahead and pushed through it and done it. Well, I think it gives us some nice meat to chew on later. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. it presents cool questions. Yeah. This is hella true. You can tell by reading the book. But he at least he's self-aware. All I do with short story ideas is rough them out, credit them to Kilgore Trout, and put them in a novel. <laughs> yep, that's what you do. <laughs> I yeah, love he's it. so direct about it. It's yeah. Great. Yeah. 
I believe it's come up in previous ones, but he does that quote of Mark Vonnegut, his son, uh, Kurt Vonnegut's son. He says, we are here to help each other get through this thing, whatever it is. Repeat. Yep. Uh, but maybe the best repeat. Yes. But so, there's, t- there's tons that uh, we'll probably skip in these blurts that are just great blurts from previous works. Yeah, it doesn't lessen the like magnitude of the insight. Yeah. It's just technically true that he said it before <laughs> in a different book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which I don't take issue with because there are things that are important enough that they bear repeating, unlike a lot of shit we repeat. I think repeating important epiphanies like Kurt's is more important than like remaking it, for example. <laughs> you know, so repetition's okay sometimes. Repetition is my job. My job. Being repetitive. Never mind. <laughs> Simpsons again. Um, but he says this could be said of Trout's writing and mine. Uh, if I'd wasted my time creating characters, I would never have gotten around to calling attention to things that really matter. Irresistible forces of nature, cruel inventions, and cockamamie ideals and governments and economies that make heroes and heroines alike feel like something the cat drug in. Yeah. And I uh, like that. It's a core Kurt sentiment. Um, but I think it explains a lot of his writing and a lot of the writing of a particular... So we were talking last time or the time before about elephant art versus termite art briefly. Yeah, right. Or formalists versus like contentists. I forget the real name. But he even has a whole section in this where he calls it swoopers versus bashers. And I just think it's... Yeah, but he basically elucidates the same thing, which is... And he puts a really great spin on it in this section, which is there are people who want to tell stories, the end. Some people who want to tell stories are on the side of the spectrum where they think life is so interesting in and of itself that they just want to hold up a mirror to what they observe and report on it. And they think Stranger Things 2 is really interesting because all they need is these fully fleshed kids having problems in their lives. Yeah. Then there's writers like Kurt Vonnegut and fucking me. I'm going to get hate for this. You already know where it's going. Who are like, ah, uh, the characters are already fictional, so who gives a fuck about convincing you that they're, like, really your friends so that you cry when someone dies in the story? Who gives a fuck? They're fictional. You know they're fictional. The only thing you can get out of this is what the underlying meaning I was trying to get across is about actual issues and thoughts, like the abstract space of thought and idea. That's what telling stories is supposed to be about. And by that rubric, Stranger Things 2 is fucking boring because nothing happens and it's not about anything. (laughs) (laughs) They're monsters and they won't kill any of the characters you like. The end. That's Stranger Things. I'm I'm really getting off on a digression here. Yeah, it's okay. Ooh, ooh. I have a lot to say about how fucking much Stranger Things sucks, but... My point, as relates to Vonnegut, is <laughs> it's a great elucidation, I think, of the two ends of the spectrum that we write stories on and why. Yeah. He's like, there's people whose brains are stuck in the abstract enough that they can't care about a character. Only a, a point. You have to have a point. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Well, and, all, and isn't there another element of the elephant versus termite thing where it's like elephant writing, you try to do the best work within the medium as it exists, and then termite art, you try to make a new medium, like break it down and uh, yes, generate something new. although I think I misled you and our audience, so I'm glad you brought this up. I switched them. Oh, really? Abe Epperson, who is the one I learned that from, and film because he learned it in film school, corrected me. I was thinking like, anyway, the real way to remember it <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> is <laughs> elephant, you're talking about the elephant in the room. <laughs> A point, like a point or a message. Okay. Termites, you're just chewing through the wood. So like in Game of Thrones, well, then what happens? Oh, well, you don't ask what does it mean that Jamie Lannister fucks his sister and gets his hand chopped off. You're just like, I like him, so I'm sad when he gets his hand chopped off. And I don't like when he fucks his sister because it makes me feel weird, but then he's kind of nice. You're just like chewing through what happens next, what happens next. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. It does. not Well, and also that Game of Thrones isn't, innovating like it's it's right. continuing to tell the story it's slang and content as the hard story as it is the right. thing and that's it and whereas elephant art is you're either talking about the elephant in the room like gun control or abortion rights or whatever your point right. is or uh the elephant in the room is i'm gonna take something you took for granted about movies or whatever the medium is and my main point is look how i swapped that thing with something else yeah like memento it's fucking backwards bitches that's the (laughs) elephant in the room the movie's obviously about that yeah yeah and i and this book timequake is the most 
that of any Vonnegut novel. I think, like even even for Vonnegut, where it's so meta and so intertextual, he's blowing that out to the point where it's kind of not even a novel now. The where characters like, are not you characters. You get it, novels. Who cares? Like right. the point is the point, and here's the points. And I think that's defensible. I'm just saying he's yeah, saying. Yeah. Yeah, the characters are characters, and you can't say I'm a bad writer because my characters aren't fully fleshed out because that was my choice. Right. If my goal was to, like, write Game of Thrones and the characters were flat and shitty, then I'm a bad writer. But I'm not trying to do that, so fuck off. (laughs) That's how I interpreted it. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah, because, I mean, he does liken literature critics to the sharks from The Old Man in the Sea who right. tear away at a beautiful marlin and make an old man want to die. <laughs> like So that's how he thinks of critics. So I think he did, was yeah. defensive <laughs> of his that, style. And that is a, a lot of people's reading of The Old Man and the Sea, which uh, before Ernest Hemingway wrote The Old Man and the Sea, he wrote a book called Across the River and Into the Trees, which critics savaged, apparently. Considered his crummiest novel. Yeah. yeah, and so he took that very personally. And then in writing The Old Man and the Sea, a lot of people have read it as... Hemingway making a statement about his whole career and also like the marlin that gets eaten by sharks is his previous book that people treated poorly. Like you try so hard to make a beautiful thing and no one cares. Yeah. They don't appreciate me enough. I'm Ernest Hemingway. <laughs> wah, wah, wah. <laughs> I think Nick yeah. Drake had more of a claim to that throne than having anyway. Yeah, I, I I so prefer his short stories to all his novels. Well, like, so especially Hem- the Nick Adams stuff is like, like Van Gogh, dude. Yeah, I don't know. Great. Hemingway was thoroughly appreciated in his lifetime. Yeah, big time. Yeah, yeah he got lots of good shit out of it. Yeah, he, he lived to win a Nobel Prize. Yeah. So like, yeah, he was fun. Yeah, yeah. You also your uh, the blurt you mentioned before involved the feel something like the cat drug in that concept, and that's sort of a mantra in this book, and really works. I think it's really great. It's part of the lexicon. There's for sure. one another blurt in it is he's talking about George Bernard Shaw because also this book Vonnegut talks a lot about other authors and, and his he talks, heroes yeah and heroes of his yeah and he talks about George Bernard Shaw is told by the city of London that Shaw will win an award and Shaw replies that I've already given myself the award ha ha and then Vonnegut says I would have accepted it. I would have recognized the opportunity for a world-class joke, but would never allow myself to be funny at the cost of making somebody else feel like something the cat drug in line break let that be my epitaph. He really works for me. Loves epitaphs. <laughs> yeah, he's uh, right. It's like so, yeah. his tenth epitaph. But he, yeah. he thinks Bob Dylan's cool for not accepting the award, but he's not that cool. He would have. He would have showed up. Yeah, just yeah, yeah. out of like awkwardness. Yeah, well, you don't want to. <laughs> They gave you the award. You got to show up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that like uh, at some point it's not about you entirely. Right. Like, it's you want to like treat other people nicely. Validate that you're more than meant that much to telling them. yourself you're important. Yeah. Yeah. When I got home from my war, Uncle Dan clapped me on the back and yeah. bellowed, "You're a man now." I damn near killed my first German. Ah, oh, it's so great. <laughs> it's really yeah. Good. Uh, similarly, from. Bunker bingo party. (laughs) I actually thought this was like really touched, like powerfully melancholy in a weird way. The story is Hitler is in the bunker. They know the allies are closing in and it's the end. He's never played bingo and the kids are trying to cheer them up by introducing them to the game bingo, which they were not aware of. So they teach them bingo and they play and Hitler wins and yells (laughs) bingo. And he's like... How crazy that I won this game I've never played. It must be a sign from God, right? (laughs) And uh, But then, uh, no, it turns out the allies win the battle, and now they're coming down the hallway, and he decides to shoot himself in the head. Oh, they're debating his last words. Like, it's important what my last words are. I'm about to shoot myself. What should my last words be? Hitler still hasn't lost his sense of humor. He says, how about bingo? (laughs) But in truth, he is tired. He puts the pistol to his head again. He says, I never asked to be born in the first place. The pistol goes bang. That's fucking (laughs) sad, dude. Yeah. It's good. (laughs) Yeah. And that's another mantra of the book is they never asked. He'll refer to everyone as like, and Brett Rader, who never asked to be born in the first place or edit this podcast, (laughs) nevertheless has to sit and listen to us ramble. Man, what if Brett was in the book and we just like find that (laughs) out reading it? Like, oh, good for Brett. Yeah. You got more? I got Uh, lots more. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Um, There's one. It's a, it's also Vonnegut goes ahead and puts a lot of his great lines in Trout's mouth in this book, partly just because he he openly says Trout is often his uh, stand in and also, right. you know, why not? But it's Trout talking about writing and Trout says, the Bible may be the greatest story ever told, 
But the most popular story you can ever tell is about a good-looking couple having a really swell time copulating outside wedlock and having to quit for one reason or another while doing it is still a novelty. Which he describes <laughs> all of Ernest Hemingway's books as. Also, he's like, that's basically the plot of every Ernest Hemingway book. Yeah, yeah. It's and, like, ah, I was fucking this really young, beautiful, innocent woman. It made me feel alive. Yeah. Then she died. So now <laughs> I just stare out to sea. <laughs> You're like, that's the life, man. <laughs> no responsibility. Just imagine yeah. your spouse as a perfect ghost who <laughs> never right. ages. Yeah. Just a nurse after a war. Right. And, um... Just an accessory to you. <laughs> it's fine that her life was lost. How does it fit into your life? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, tingling. Yeah. Well, and he also, and later in this book, he'll, Kurt Vonnegut complains about television, which is the thing he loves to do. Uh, but I feel like that story style also applies big time to almost all of TV and movies and soap operas. And, you know, they're just all about couples being frustrated sure yeah joan didion has a great short story about story structure i forget what it's called so i won't recommend it but it's just every it's like a choose your own adventure of every possible plot line that can happen and just like john and jill exist go to a if you want it to be a romance or whatever and you always end up at the end which is they die they die they die they die they die oh, that's <laughs> awesome it's cool yeah <laughs> All right, quote, when I sent him, my friend Ed Muir, a letter about my case of writer's block, he made it look like a poem and returned it, which was just neat. Yeah. Uh, he was, as he was lamenting that Time Quake wasn't coming together, he sent his friend who is a poet a long letter saying, I'm done, I'm too old, nothing I write will ever be in a poetic form again. And the guy just formatted it as a poem and sent it back and was like, look, this is a good poem. And he's like, <laughs> you got me. You cheered me up, the uncheerable yeah. man. <laughs> that, that was great. There's a, And there's a few parts of this book where Vonnegut is quoting his own personal letters to mm -hmm. you in, in his book directly. And it tends to work. It's great. Like there's another one where it's him writing back and forth with his brother Bernard and Bernard has, uh, we'll talk a bit more, more about this in Bonnet Art, but has started to try to do visual art a bit, but is also being kind of a dick about it and saying like, yeah, this is art, right? How do you know? Art's bullshit. And then Vonnegut writes back to him saying that, well, actually the game of art is showing it to people in an earnest way and them making an earnest decision whether it means something to them or not. So you actually need to do that. And the and line, art involves the interpretation of, or are you going to say the bucket line? Well, there's one, there's one, Sorry. my favorite line in yeah, it go. is, pictures are famous for their humanness and not for their pictureness. Nice, yeah. Which is just such a perfect line about all of art. Like, like, like the people who are like, oh, that piece of modern art is just a bunch of red and that's it. That's not art. It's like, no, it is art if people get something out of it. And it's not if they don't. Right. Like, and that's his brother who was a scientist was kind of snidely like, is this art? It looks artistic. Got you. I yeah. generated it with a series of algorithms. It's not art. And he's like, <laughs> but it is though. And he's like, well, how can you say that with authority? And he's like, Everyone's an authority. Like, I could play you Mozart's The Magic Flute and then kick a metal bucket down the stairs. And if you said one is art and one is not, and I said why, and you said I don't like the sound of the bucket, the end, that's fine. I wouldn't question that review of what is art and what is not. Yeah, right. Which is funny because there are composers like Edgar Varez who made music out of stuff like kicking a bucket down the stairs. And a lot of people also respond to that. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, it's in the eye of the beholder. Um, similarly, well, I think he might have said this before, but he repeats it here and it's worth repeating. Artists are people who say, I can't fix my country or my state or my city or even my marriage, but by golly, I can make this square of canvas or these 12 bars of music or whatever exactly what they ought to be. Yeah. Did he say that in a previous book? It's actually a quote from I, a teacher of his. I think he cites it in a, a like essay collection. Essay paper. collection, yeah. great. Well, he repeats yeah, it yeah. here, and it's worth repeating. Yeah, it's great. There's also there's sort of a new line about a thing he's talked about before, which is he's talking about uh, the depression running in his family and through himself, and he says, then again, I am a monopolar depressive descended from monopolar depressives. That's how come I write so good. I love that. Great it's joke. Just a great joke. Solid. Yeah. <laughs> That's how come I write so good. I think he's very guilty, as I've said, of royal uh, royal astronomy, which we defined last episode. Yeah. If you're unaware, it's a reference to the White Deer by James Thurber, but it's the idea of like 
everything sucks now. It was better when I was a kid. <laughs> well, provably not really. That's just because you're getting old and the world seems less comfortable to you. He's so guilty of that, even though he can be aware that it exists. Right. He's still super guilty of it, and I love calling him out on it. He says like how TV is terrible now. And it's like the source of all sin and it's just shit. And I'll get on that a little bit more in Vanuat. But the one I want to bring up here is he says, uh, but it used to be good when there were only three channels. When I was a kid, TV was a force for good because it united community. We might, here's the quote, we might even call up a friend that very night and ask a question to which we already knew the answer. Did you see that? Wow. No more and never again. Hell no, never again. Now we have the internet <laughs> and memes that are literally like a secret in-joke shared lexicon and a little box called a cell phone where you go to your friend and you go, did you see that crazy shit that's now been viewed by 80 million people? And if they say no, you can literally show it to them right then. How yeah. is that not a uniting communal experience? Yeah. So I just think his... And he mentions, quote, the information superhighway. I love that at the end of his life, it did exist. So he is like vaguely aware of it. Oh, yeah. And like I, he mentions it's... surfing the information superhighway in, in, a, in a part. <laughs> and I just think it's so natural and funny that even Kurt Vonnegut viewed it with suspicion and is like, the internet, sure, these kids are getting together in these damn chat rooms, but it's, I bet it's bad. <laughs> it used to be good because <laughs> you'd talk around the water cooler about the thing you saw last night, and now you text about a meme? I don't like it. <laughs> you're like, it's the same. It's just a different yeah. packaging. It's the same. No, it's, yeah, it's a good call because it is at once much less of a universal culture that we all know about and much more of one. Because like you say, we are attention is much more spread out among a lot of different things, but also we can all gather around a thing instantly. Yeah. Like we can all just go look at it right now. I easily. do think a trend is things are faster and faster and faster and your life is fuller and fuller and fuller of more different components, like going through thousands of years of human history. But we'll never not want to be connected in communities of some fashion. Yeah. I just think the when the internet was first invented, there were all these dystopian stories where like everyone looks at their phone so much during meals that now no one has a soul. And I'm like, it won't <laughs> go that far, guys. I just don't I'm not scared yeah. of that. Yeah. Yes, people look at their phone on the bus now instead of talking to a stranger. I don't think that's a huge loss, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I still talk to my friends. <laughs> <laughs> well, I also, because there is that meme of, it's, well, it was not a specific meme, but that concept of people being like, yeah, people used to talk on transportation and now they're just all up in their phones. And there's a great cartoon I saw where they draw a bunch of people on their phones and then just show their screens where it's like, hey, I love you, mom. Or like, right, we're like, all going to go you, meet up later. What do you think they're doing or, on their phones? Like, <laughs> Instead of killing time doing small talk with a stranger you'll never see again, right. they're engaging their community. <laughs> <laughs> right, they're like using it to talk for the most part. Yeah. yeah. There's also, this is one of the few where when Kurt's being a Luddite about tech or about community spreading out, I do agree with one part of it in a big way where he says that like TV used to be a couple of channels with very richly constructed dramas on them. And now it's a billion cable channels with a bunch of crap on them. And like, yeah, he's right. Like but there it was, used there, to be there a... were like these masterful playhouse <laughs> things on TV. And now it's just a slew of a bunch of different things. But there's still the, everything you want exists if you, buy the right cable package. Or yes. I guess yeah, like, that's true. Yeah. yeah. At a certain point, there were only four books and only rich people owned them. Is it bad that <laughs> right. there's a million books now? What's the difference? Right. Yeah, there was a point where all popular culture was, was driven the, by Bible Only references. the Bible. Yeah. Like, is that better? <laughs> it's not great. <laughs> and if you think it is, call in because we'd love to speak with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you think it is, you probably have not moved on to also read the works of Kurt Vonnegut. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, so sorry we're messing you. <laughs> yeah. Quote, we serve as well we can the highest abstraction of which we have some understanding, which is our community. Yeah. I thought he finally summed up in a really great way what secular humanism is. It's saying we don't know if God exists or doesn't exist, so we will do the best to better the most noble thing we are aware definitely exists, which is the community and yeah. like the interconnectedness yeah. of every living thing on earth obviously exists and impact each other. And we know that, so we'll serve that. I thought that was great. Yeah, really. Yeah, it's a great because there are 
yeah, there's so many arguments for humanism being very human and being very interconnecting. Mm -hmm. That's a great way to put it. This is one about also just how we handle things. It's a tr it gives it to Trout. In real life, as in grand opera, arias only make hopeless situations worse. Hmm. Sort of a great way to put, like, don't, what what my partner calls fitfo, like, don't freak the fuck out. Just, oh. just like, don't <laughs> when things go wrong, uh, you roll with it. Yeah. Yeah. Or in that uh, sunscreen speech, often misattributed to Vonnegut, don't worry about your problems or worry, but know that worrying helps as much as chewing bubble gum or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Vonnegut didn't but, write it, so I don't have to quote it correctly. Yeah, Mary Schmidt. Oh, is that? Wow, good memory. She's a, She writes for the Chicago Sun-Times, uh, and yeah. so I, I read her a lot. Probably, Funny that so it, har it was harder it for you to remember Chicago Sun-Times than Mary Schmidt. <laughs> I, I was, <laughs> we had that on the trip, but I always, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Quote, I like to sleep. I see no need up in the sky for more torture chambers and bingo games. That's about how he does. he hopes there isn't an afterlife. That's great. I got distracted by it. Mary Schmitz wrote for the trip, actually. I messed oh, that up. Oh, fine. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Don't even care. <laughs> <laughs> Quote, I was feeling then as I feel now, like whalers Herman Melville described who didn't talk anymore. They had simply said absolutely everything they could ever say about yeah. writer's block. <laughs> yeah, it was great. Yeah. I define a saint as a person who behaves decently in an indecent society. Nice. Yeah. Humanists, by and large, educated, comfortably middle class persons with rewarding lives like mine, find rapture enough in secular knowledge and hope. Most people can't. And that's his explanation about why he thinks he could never believe in religion as it's depicted, meaning miracles happen and there's a force that cares about you and yeah. knows everything and there was a snake or whatever. He can't believe in that, but he would never tell someone who believes in it. Like, he would never be a Richard Dawkins guy. Like, you're full of shit. You got to wake <laughs> up, man. Because he thinks if you can believe in religion, that's great. And it's helpful. And right. faith is lovely. And he thinks the reason he was an atheist is because his life was good enough, which is an interesting twist. He has the luxury to be an atheist. And he learned this from Nietzsche, who also believes this. Because... His life is easy enough that he can have the luxury of doubting faith and shit. Whereas yeah. people with truly terrible lives keep God or whatever their religious belief is at the core of their life because what the fuck else? Like, what are they supposed to admit to themselves that they're just unlucky and life is unfair and their life will suck no matter what? And they probably will never get out of this hole or whatever yeah. just because. Like, <laughs> so it's okay. Anyway, what I realized is. I think despair, the kind of despair he has throughout of his books is a similar luxury. Uh, like uh. He, he posits in this book that he's kind of surprised that, here's my point, reading all of his books in a row has really depressed me and like legitimately made me consider suicide as less of a, less of a sin or trespass or scary thing as more of like, oh, well, if Vonnegut thought it was a valid choice someone could make, how is it not? Like, it's an option on the table. And Oh, man, but and it's I, not. But he, but it is. No. I mean, it is. Uh. Um, but I think he was getting in my head too much. And the reason is he got in this book, he questions like, he, he says he and another author friend who is like big into helping homeless people was like, how many percentage of people on earth do you think have lives worth living where they wouldn't be better off killing themselves? Yeah. And he says almost as a flippant joke, they arrive at the number 17%. Right. When I was young, I thought that was like funny and so true because I imagined I'm in the 17%. <laughs> now that he is an old, rich, like white man right. who's able to say that, I read it more as like smug and it kind of bothered me. And I, yeah, it made me yeah. think, you know what? The ability to flippantly go like, life isn't worth living. We should just kill ourselves. Most people should just kill themselves. I'm like, that's really easy for you to say when you have a nice life, which is counterintuitive. No, that makes sense. Yeah, But I've also yeah. had just, if you look at it statistically, a great life, a lot of breaks in my life. Yeah, same here. Yeah. And I'm also depressed a lot. Whereas yep. something he points out is people who have real hard shit going on almost never contemplate suicide. Obviously, a minority do. But like, ho there are homeless people who have been homeless for 25 years and are busting their ass, but they can't get out of this hole or they have an addiction they can't beat. And... When the people who work with them say, as a part of the medical examination, do you ever have thoughts of self-destruction? Yeah. They're often surprised. And they're like, that never occurred to me. And he leaves it at that. He basically says that so, in fact, he posits, which I also think is pretty smug, that they lack the imagination to think, 
of suicide as an option. And I actually, am, it cheered me up that people who are undergoing real shit, I'm like, actually, I think it's that if you really have real tough challenges, you're probably so focused on, I got to solve this challenge. I need the next meal. I need housing. Or if this is where you're at in life, I need the next hit, whatever, like your challenges, or the voices in my head are like trying to get me to like do crimes and I try to resist, yeah. like whatever your real shit is, it keeps you focused on real shit. And I do think it's easy to be depressed when your life is fine in a weird way. Yeah, no, I, I get, I get what you're, well, and also yeah. when you said like, he's not a Richard Dawkins type where he's saying religion is like a sickness or an evil or something. He is, he's doing like, the other asshole atheist thing where he's yes. he's like, yes, religion is fine for you, the hoi polloi who I'm are too smart to struggling and it, weak. But, sure. Yeah, you know, <laughs> like there is, I, I think he means to come at it from a compassionate place, but there's a reading of it where he's being an asshole. Like he's, he's like, Oh yeah. The catnip for you dummies. Sure. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this was just, this podcast was a real journey to me into like a person who I feel is a kindred spirit who says things that seem so true to me was so depressed most of the time and tried to commit suicide. How that, do I right. not just think he's right and I should just do what he said? <laughs> when I think and this book helped bring me out of it or at least realize he's just human also and he's sharing his point of view and you don't have to just imbibe it completely. Yeah, well, because also I, there might be, as, as you're talking about this stuff, I'm realizing there might be some kind of argument where not only is he sort of a tourist of a truly sad life because he's not having all these terrible things happen mm -hmm. to him that the homeless and, and others have, but he also is sort of a tourist of what suicide would actually mean because he attempted it and was just fine. You know, like, I, there's not sure. there's not really a way where there would be an equivalent, but like somebody that's like, there's not a version of somebody who's like, I really lived suicide because I'm dead now. You know, like <laughs> yeah. no one's alive to say and that. Here's what I think. But yeah. if Vonnegut didn't totally have the suicide experience. You know what I mean? <laughs> like he, no one is alive who has, but you know what I mean? I don't know if that totally makes sense. I was just distracted by a theological question. Is it is Jesus considered to have committed suicide since God is in everyone? Oh, I have no idea. And then oh, he man. would have been someone who committed suicide and commented on it after the fact. But that's oh, that's neither uh, yeah. here nor there. That's so far above my pay grade. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Good digression. No, that's great. Yeah, but I yeah, it is. Uh, it's worth weighing how Vonnegut considers suicide and whether whether other people have a reason to commit it. Because, yeah, it's such a – that's, like, such a heavy thing that he often pretty casually feeling tackles. Yeah. yeah it's, it's kind of amazing that he can do that, I guess. Yeah. For example, quote, I didn't need a time quake to teach me being alive is a crock of shit, which is pretty dark already. Yeah. I already know that from my childhood and crucifixes and history books. Whew. <laughs> yeah it is on, very dude. much like carlin <laughs> was saying to kurt <laughs> yeah carlin they followed a similar trend carlin was always like yeah joke 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 fuck society joke joke life is depressing as shit joke joke but towards the end he was like life is shit life is shit life is shit oh yeah here's a joke life is shit life is shit like the balance shifted as they got older <laughs> yeah the, yeah i'm glad because yeah previous episode phase worse than death talked a bit about carlin and his progression sort of matching kurt yeah. at the end or toward the end and yeah they both at times i think hit a point where they're like me doing a mathematical proof of life being shit yeah that is the whole joke i'm gonna do like there's yeah. not there's not a laugh line after it and uh you know if you're smart enough you'll probably think it's see that this is humorous here yeah but that's like it. humorous in the that's ironic way <laughs> right like that, that's all here you go <laughs> uh yeah like i think you got to be pretty cynical to say this it's a joke he's said twice now about humanity what is the white stuff in bird poop Answer that is bird poop too, which I take. To I actually, mean, I really like that just as a joke, like just oh. pure pure form formatting. It's, it's fun. I yeah. think it harkens back to Mother <laughs> Night. Like you don't have virtuous insides. Uh, oh, our favorite myth yeah. to tell ourselves is that even though humans rape and kill and molest children and have wars, we have a soul that's this indestructible good thing, and everyone has that deep down. Yeah. No, he doesn't. And he's the joke is basically, no, you don't. Humans are exactly as shitty as they seem to be. Their inside is shit as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the symbolic weight of it is it's rough. pretty yeah. heavy. Yeah. <laughs> we were talking about religion just then before. This is a blurt about that a bit where Vonnegut says, 
the basis of any great advertisement is a credible promise. Jesus promised better times in an afterlife. Trout was promising the same thing in the here and now. When he's That's talking great. about Trout getting people out of the quake and, and the actual novel bit. Yeah. And you want to put the best lines in Trout's mouth because that's how you catch fish. Put a line in a... All right. Quote, why throw money at problems? That is what money is for. Should the nation's wealth be redistributed? It has been and continues to be redistributed to a few people in a manner strikingly unhelpful. Yeah. True that. Snaps. (laughs) There's also uh, uh, another class thing, sort of. Vonnegut says, listen. A Harvard education from my Uncle Alex wasn't the trophy of a micromanaged Darwinian victory over others that it is today. And he's talked about that uh, real thing a few times in his essays where his Uncle Alex went to Harvard before it was what it is now. It was just the family had some money and he wanted to be educated and they just sent him there and then he came back and became an insurance salesman. But it isn't the thing where you go to Harvard and then become president, you know. Not that there there were presidents coming out of Harvard for, for a long time, but anyway. You but it was like a sign yeah. of the aristocracy, which is not anything anymore as yeah. much. Yeah. I mean, it is, but it's solely how much money you got in your bank account. No one cares about like the num- letters after your name. Yeah, exactly. Quote, I believe in original sin. I also believe in original virtue. Look around. Yeah. A little less cynical than <laughs> I like that. <laughs> this is one about communism because uh, Vonnegut says that uh, he describes both the word fuck and the word communism as words that were unsayable in media for a long time. It was just offensive. And he calls communism, quote, an activity as commonly and innocently practiced in many primitive societies as fucking. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> that both words denote something that are things that are so natural that if you put a bunch of cavemen in a biodome, yeah. They would probably practice a primitive form of communism, and you bet your butt they'd fuck. <laughs> and now you can't even say either of those words. Like how perverted is society to get to the point where we're ashamed of lovemaking, and we think it's evil to want to share all the food equally amongst the people. Weird. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. a great one. Yeah, yeah. Quote, many people need desperately to receive this message. I feel and think much as you do care about many of the things you care about, although most people don't care about them. You are not alone. And it's a great Such quote. A one. I just say it with a sigh because I think we've said it three or four times. Yeah. But you almost before. have to say it when it comes up because it's nice. <laughs> well, yeah, especially because in other parts of this book, he's much darker about things, especially writing. Like he's kind of kidding about writing yeah. novels throughout this book, but he still recognizes their value and their importance. Yeah. Yeah. This is uh, just about the country. It's a tra- he gives it to Trout. America is the interplay of 300 million Rube Goldberg contraptions invented only yesterday. And I love that. I had that line as well because he talks about, he, then he explains what a Rube Goldberg machine, which is, which is like a cartoonishly absurd, overly complicated device used to like open a window or something or make toast. And I think he's tying it symbolically to like what society is. Like we were just saying, We'll put in place incredibly elaborate counterintuitive legislation to, let's say, misinterpret a sentence written 200 years ago so that you can own an AR-15 Yeah. (laughs) versus we will not practice very simple things that cultures have known for thousands of years make life bearable, like a large extended family that, you know, has a shared community center. Yeah. Um, there's like easy solutions we won't do, and we do unnecessarily complicated shit that's not even in our best interest, and that's why we're fucked, <laughs> 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 which is kind of true. Yeah, even even just the basic idea that everybody's kind of a... a all adults are kids just pretending they know what they're doing. You know, like, like a lot way, of yeah. leaders and important figures are just like, oh, crap, I'm the Pope now? Right. Uh, this. And Not even in your Pope, life, but just, yeah. you know. <laughs> even in your life, in retrospect, and it's always in retrospect, realizing you put too way much effort into something that didn't really matter that much and not enough effort in shit that you took for granted that yeah. was the important shit. <laughs> and if you're the Pope, that affects everyone, oh, unfortunately. No. <laughs> um, here's one of my favorites because I'm a nerd, and I think it's one of those Coen Brothers shots or like writing tricks that's just so cool. Monica Pepper and Trout are kind of soulmates in the book. They don't, not literally, there's no romance, but they represent the same things and they work together and they're like the two main characters. And they share a wall. 
Yeah, like he's sleeping yeah. in a homeless shelter right next to the wall that is the wall of her office in the institute. That's the obvious symbol would, that cues you up to look for symbols that tie them together. And then I found this one that I think is intentional and so awesome if it is. Quote, Hanging over the rosewood desk of Monica Pepper was a painting of a bleached cow's skull on a desert floor by Georgia O'Keeffe. On Trout's side of the wall, right over the head of his cot, was a poster telling him never to stick his ding-dong into anything without putting on a condom. I just want to say, her desk is rosewood. Rose is a traditional symbol of the vagina. Wood is a traditional symbol of the penis. Uh. Georgia O'Keeffe's paintings are famous for being yonic, meaning vaginal. Yeah. On Trout's side, right over the head of his cot, which to me sounds like head of his cock, is a poster about ding-dongs. So literally, like, their two rooms want to fuck. <laughs> <laughs> their rooms belong together in the way that a ding-dong belongs in a vagina, but not without a condom on. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's something. <laughs> I, think I think there's right. something there. Because they even they even play it as a... Well, also, if, if you want to keep finding things like... One thing Monica does as just things in New York City go wrong, partly unrelated to the time quake, just things are getting worse. She uh, self-vandalizes the Academy of Arts and Letters and spray paints fuck art across the front of it to make it look like it's already been looted. So to no make it work, look it. like it's not worth breaking into. Yeah. yeah. So like that's very uh, sexual. <laughs> like fuck She and... writes fuck art and then their respective arts fuck. Right. <laughs> yeah. and, like, and like she's <laughs> running the artistic organization that is waiting to re- Receive the artist Kilgore Trout. Yes, you know, that's like there's true. a lot of reception. Oh, that that's got to be true. Stuff. Because yeah. also every night he deposits his load of fiction into a receptacle that is chained to the front door of the academy. Yeah, it's intentional. Yeah, there's a lot of so, biology going on. Yeah, there was yeah. some kind of nascent fucking symbol through line that only partially got translated because he crammed various versions of the books together. Yeah, but I just love that it goes to show that he thought that deeply so you can go back and read the books five times and still get a thing that you didn't notice before that's so cool and that, that's my favorite shit that's why the Coens are the best I'm glad you found that I, I, I wouldn't yeah. have put that together yeah well, and I think I, I think I only have two more blurts okay so I, I don't know I can I'll do one 19 no uh, not true no you can do uh, I have four we can really blurt this one up yeah. uh, <laughs> this is one it's super specific but it's just a good joke that, that he gives to Kilgore Trout about the Lincoln assassination he calls it quote the sort of thing which is bound to happen whenever an actor creates his own material <laughs> that's good <laughs> it's just a really yeah, funny way good. to frame Booth shooting Lincoln <laughs> although I think the funniest thing in the entire book to me and this will be extra funny if you're a comedy Bang Bang fan especially but I think <laughs> Everyone's aware of this guy. Quote, and this is from his real life, and he doesn't mean it to be funny. That's what I think is so funny. I met mystery author Dick Francis at the Kentucky Derby years ago, and he told me something about a horse. <laughs> Like, of course he did. Where would you meet Dick Francis? At a horse race? What's the only thing that he's going to do? Tell you something about a horse. <laughs> like, when you're going to see a man about a horse, the man is Dick Francis. Do you know Dick Francis? No. He is like a jockey who retired to write mystery novels and wrote like oh, in 85 Bang mystery Bang? novels. No, in real life. <laughs> oh. But every mystery novel features a horse-related crime that takes place at a horse track. <laughs> and it's insane. Every cover is just a picture of a horse. And the titles are all really dumb. They're like these broad, shitty mystery novels where there's always a horse detective <laughs> employed by a racetrack to find out what happened because there was a horse crime. So I'm like, of course you met him, A, at the Kentucky Derby, and B, he was like, literally his quote is saying like, you know, life, life's kind of like a horse. And you're like, <laughs> of course, Dick Francis. Of course it's like a horse. <laughs> That's all. What an over-specialized person. So That's over amazing. I love him. <laughs> Look up Dick Francis. His whole life is horse-related. There's nothing he did. It was like, he was born on horseback and became a jockey who later did horse crimes and then wrote about horse crimes. <laughs> <laughs> he was killed by a horse and buried alive inside a horse. <laughs> oh, Dickie boy. 
That's so like <laughs> I'm thinking of the office when Michael Scott creates his character like Agent Michael Scarn. Yeah. He's like also a paper salesman or whatever. Like, yeah. oh, great. Like, no, the, there's just a running <laughs> joke in Comedy Bang Bang that Scott Ackerman believes Dick Francis was a horse like in disguise. <laughs> That's That's <all>. yeah. <laughs> Trying to get horse agendas out into the world. <laughs> God, I, I can't wait to dive down that rabbit hole. This is gonna be great. <laughs> I can do my my last one is mm -hmm. partly it's from the epilogue it's from the very end of the book and this is one of the rare novels where I feel like the last page or two really helped pay it off for me a lot more and the quote is just I was the baby of the family now I don't have anybody to show off for anymore and it just adds a whole nut because he in the epilogue really focuses on Bernard Vonnegut dying and throughout the rest of the book has been talking about people his around him and dying his mother, yeah. and it's the book really plays as a funeral for his writing and himself. And like, it, it is a lot more human to me reading the very ending of it and realizing like, oh, he thinks he's like dead. Like, wow. Which is funny about, again, <laughs> about the Royal Astronomy. I think in that light, it's pretty smug that at the end of the book, he says, we wept not only for the death of Lincoln, but the death of American eloquence. Yeah, and the implication is because he's retiring from writing. Right, that's the epitaph smug, on yeah. American eloquence. <laughs> like writing's done now, and he also posits that he goes, you know, a thousand years ago, almost no one could read. Like Cleopatra couldn't read, and he goes, twenty years, that'll be true again. And I'm like, we're not gonna stop reading books just because you died, Kurt Vonnegut. You were the best author of all time, <laughs> but we're still gonna read books even after you pass. I'm sorry. Yeah, no offense. <laughs> I'm going to just say again, Trout's Credo, because it's wonderful. You were sick, but now you're well again, and there's work to do. That yeah. saved the book for me. That's the blur of the book. Yeah, it's, it's one of Vonnegut's best lines ever. It's, yeah. And actually, two things saved and the book concepts. for me. Okay, uh, the first half of the book, I really liked the book. Then there started, there's a middle section where so many problematic things stack up that I started to hate the book, which we'll get to. Yeah. And then at the end, it did manage to save itself for me with a couple mind blowers. That being one, and then the other one being the final image itself, the final image of the book, which is Trout in front of all the playgoers and like people at the clam bake saying, I just have one final demonstration for you and then I'll go die, which he does. <laughs> I want to demonstrate something to you. Look at that star in the sky. Now look at another star nearby. How long would you say it took to flick your like a mental attention from one to the other? Less than a second. Well, you just traveled faster than the speed of light. There, And the quote is, your awareness is a new quality in the universe which exists only because there are human beings. And it's the best scientific argument I've ever come across. Ray Bradbury makes a similar argument throughout his writings that humans are divine or have some soul or like reason to exist. Yeah. Even if you only believe in science. Right. Which is that the universe needs to perceive itself and we are the tools by which the universe, like Bradbury would say, the show needs an audience. Like, why do you need a higher purpose than you're here to witness how cool everything is. And of course, a lot of religious people feel that that's why we're here for God, is just to worship God. Yeah. And it's a similar feeling, but just about literally physics and shit. Like, I don't need there to be a humanoid God that did it. Galaxies are amazing and deserve to be worshipped just by, like, investigating them, looking at them, going, wow, trying to figure out how they work. That's a form of worship. And then I just have to mention that it's technically inaccurate because... Oh, was, no. <laughs> His eyes were actually only flicking between the light particles from that star as they entered his cornea to the other light particles as they entered his cornea from the other star. And even if those stars are billions of light years apart, the light particles as they enter his eyes are only as far apart as his eyes are on his face. Yeah, right. Does that make sense? So, it does, yeah. yeah. Science like the, ruins your beautiful thing about science, Kurt. Yeah, like the, the artistic point in that speech is not It's not scientific. scientifically yeah, accurate. Right. <laughs> You're not looking at the and star. That's, yeah. that's the whole reason it's cool that like the light from the sun is eight minutes old already when you see it. Yeah, and that that's a really interesting point you make that there are other actual little, actual scientific things that are fascinating and worth being blown away by totally. that he's not calling out. Yeah, he's like but making one up. It's still a great one. <laughs> yeah. I'm all for it. That's all my blurts. Yeah, me too. All right. Um, I think from here we can go into a segment called Ad Time. Da, do, do, do. Is there a song for do, Ad do, do, Time? Do, I guess do, do, there do, do, is. Do, do, do. We're going to go away and we'll miss you. <laughs> 
Support for today's show comes from Audible. Audible content includes an unmatched selection of audiobooks, original audio shows, news, comedy, and more from the leading audiobook publishers, broadcasters, entertainers, magazine and newspaper publishers, and business information providers. That's a lot. Unlike a streaming or rental service with Audible, you own your books, so you can access them anytime, anywhere, right from your smartphone. Plus, thanks to the Great Listen Guarantee, if you don't like your title, you can swap it in for a new one. You can even switch back and forth between reading and listening to audiobooks across devices, including Amazon's Kindle and Echo, without ever losing your place or missing a word. It's a really optimal experience, however you like to read or hear or both your books. If you know me, you know I'm way into Ray Bradbury, and uh, in particular his short stories and his things that are kind of a stitched together kind of book. I really enjoy having both options for reading it. If I can recommend one, Ray Bradbury's The Martian Chronicles has a radio dramatization by the colonial radio players. It's like that old school kind of radio theater thing, and it's a perfect way to experience that book because it's so heady and so spooky and goes so many different directions. Also right now, Audible is offering us Vana friends a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to audible.com slash Kurt V, that's K-U-R-T-V, to browse the unmatched selection of audio programs, download a title for free, and start listening. Maybe I even pick a Kurt Vonnegut book. How about that? Go to audible.com slash Kurt V. That is audible.com slash Kurt V, K-U-R-T-V, and get started today. Thank you, sponsor. Wow. And now we can go into... Amazing sponsorship. Truly. And now another segment called Recurring Characters Update. I can't even get over that sponsor. I mean, I know I'm talking <laughs> over the intro song, but... Woo! <laughs> what a product. Yeah. Yeah, we're very grateful. And... Uh, <laughs> As far as recurring characters go, this is one where I, I know I kind of whipped us through the basic plot of it. I kind of want to whip through the recurring characters, too, because there's Kilgore Trout, who is a major character that we've seen in a bunch of the books. He's a character in God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater and Breakfast of Champions. He's a pseudonym in Jailbird. He's the unnamed author of a Trail from Midor story in Hocus Pocus. He's in Galapagos. Yeah, da, 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 da. And then... Beyond that, there's the phrase Ting-a-ling, which is also in Jailbird. And then other than that, there's the clam bake, which you can just kind of go read if you want to at home. Like It's a mm -hmm. list of everyone Kurt has ever known in fiction and in life yeah. hanging out with him at a party. So like you can just go see all the other recurring characters there. They're all hanging out. Yep. Yeah. That's about it. Yeah. Very yeah. thorough, Alex. Mark Leeds says in his excellent The Vonnegut Encyclopedia that there are 44 trout fictional stories or related pieces across Vonnegut's work, and a yeah. bunch of them are in this book. It's yeah. packed with them, like Michael said. Zip it up and yeah. zip it out. Zip, zip, zip. <laughs> and then, well, it's also, it's probably worth mentioning, Ting -a Ling comes from, in this book, Time Quake, a story where a guy is trying to hide, but his balls are exposed. Oh, yeah, I have that in the meat. They, uh, so I have a bunch okay. of questions about it. Can Let's we talk save about it that for in me? the meat. Let's save right. it for me. Let's go straight to another segment called Kurt Cameo. This time <laughs> I'm <laughs> involved because <laughs> I had a thing to say. <laughs> Kurt Cameo is very direct here. Trout is his stand-in. Vonnegut's also in the book, and he says explicitly that Trout is often his stand-in. Aha! Aha! Oh, no. But, Alex. Michael has risen from his seat. Did you notice? With passion. Did you notice that? And I'm paying you back because you noticed one that I didn't notice that was amazing. <laughs> when the time quake ends, the reason that trout comes into the institute is because a smoke alarm is going off even though the institute's not on fire and that tiny detail sets everything in motion that needs to happen to get everyone to the clan bake and it's never revealed who yeah. left the cigar smoking under the fire alarm because there's no smoking allowed no one else was in the building and they don't know who put that cigar there yeah and they kind of try to investigate a little bit who it might be they can't says, figure it out could it be that there were poltergeists and then he never mentions it again it was him kurt because oh. kurt liked to smoke smoked all the time yeah kurt smoked the cigar in the art institute just like in breakfast of champions Kurt's, cool kurt is the mysterious stranger with the dark glasses i believe in my heart I think you're right. Yeah, it's Kurt's the guy. And then that's an authorial act in his own world exactly. to set everything up, kind of like he manipulates things in breakfast. Right, he manipulated the one detail that he needed to to make everything happen, so obviously it's him. 
That's really you cool. Sly, salty dog. <laughs> well, because also, I think we can tie straight into another segment called Vana Art. Going so fast, we hope <laughs> it's going to last, <laughs> and we'll miss you when you're gone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's nice. This book only has a couple pieces of art in it, but one of them is, awesome. uh, <laughs> at, is amazing, because at the very beginning, there's a piece of art that Vonnegut drew, which is called Trout and Cohoes. And it's a, uh, it's like right in the title page in mine, but it's a portrait of Trout's head with many, many eyes and a birdcage behind it. And the caption open on bird it, cage, symbol of freedom. Yes, open bird cage. And the caption on it is: Out of print science fiction writer Kilgore Trout in Cohoes, New York, in 1975, having learned of the death of his estranged son Leon in a Swedish shipyard, having given his parakeet Cyclone Bill his freedom, and about to become a vagabond. And I think the setting in that caption ties the book to the Galapagos universe yep. and also the Breakfast of Champions universe where there is Trout and also his son Leon moving through it. Definitely which... Galapagos. How make the breakfast connection for me. Because in Galapagos, parakeet. Trout appears as that son and that son indeed was decapitated in Sweden. Yeah, so it's very yeah. specific to that. And well, I think that ties to Breakfast of Champions on its own, Galapagos, okay. but also this. And But I, I think that all helps your really, really cool theory that the cigar that sets everything in motion is from Vonnegut because if this ties to that breakfast universe where Vonnegut moves around his own right. book manipulating things, then he would do it in this book too. Yeah, he is allowed to because yeah. it's part of that. And it also, the breakfast verse. Yeah, I love it. It's great. I would play the shit out of an MMORPG set in the breakfast verse. Oh, that'd be so cool. <laughs> but no one else would. <laughs> <laughs> you have to constantly keep despair at bay or you just freak out and hit your right. left ones. <laughs> <laughs> You're just like Bunny Hoover leveling up your piano skills. Yes. Or like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you, and your main enemy is ennui. Like, I need to practice piano, but I'm full of ennui. I must dispel it. Your weapon is a single silk scarf floating in a void. <laughs> you lash at the ennui. Yeah. Yeah, man. Vonnegut video game. Into it. Let's do it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. World of Vonnegut. Mini game where you try not to get decapitated while building a ship and you can't win. <laughs> and at the end, it's like, that's life. Get it. <laughs> <laughs> now a million years of watching an island. <laughs> yeah. Well, and also that, just that piece of art, it's hard to show you art on a podcast, but... But I've, the caption to, itself is worth reading. It's a great caption. <laughs> yeah. Well, and also, and honestly, just like, I've gotten to see a little bit of uh, just exhibitions of Vonnegut visual art. And also, Michael, you have a great book of a bunch of his visual art. And mm -hmm. I think that portrait is my favorite one, just in general. Of Thanks all of to it. the caption. Yes. Partly, yeah. Partly. Well, and also just that overall... It's such an interesting way to depict Trout as being kind of overwhelmed by how much he sees and his vision and his many eyes. And, and uh, he looks really ragged in it in a good way. It's just, it works for me. Let's look at some of the uh, few other pieces of visual stuff in this. There is a, in chapter 43, there's, you get to see a little liney thing that is what Bernard Vonnegut has presented as art. And he captions it with just art or not, which sets off the whole letter between Bernard and Kurt about what is art. And I think Kurt uh, really slam dunks him, really <laughs> wins the argument on what art is. And, and then, his art was just paint squeezed between two layers of plexiglass to make a random squishy pattern. Yeah, That's I think what it's so, the yeah. image of. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's just the thing that incites it. Right. He and he's saying, how can this be art? Or it looks like art, right? It's pretty, but how can it be art when I made it with no conscious effort? Yeah. And he's like, well, it's still art. Burn. Sorry. <laughs> you made art by accident, motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. Right. right. <laughs> And then, uh, and then in the next chapter, chapter 44, you see the label for Wincoop Brewing Company's Kurt's Mile High Lager, which is, yeah. uh, it can, includes a self-portrait of Kurt by Kurt. Yeah. And uh, it's just cool. You Purely know, fun to see. see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't think it has meaning. Yeah. And that's that's all the pieces of visual stuff in the book. By far, the Cahoas portrait is my favorite. Yes, and the most definitely. Meaningful. Yeah. But uh, he's still, we still see him using a little bit of visual art very, very judiciously in one way. And also he's just kind of, I think, throwing in the other stuff. Like Hocus Pocus, he did it pretty perfectly, I thought, in terms of selecting yeah. when to do visuals. And this one, there's, to me, one perfect one at the beginning and then just a couple other things thrown in. Mm -hmm. Let's go into a new segment. This is called Vana Amendments. We pledge allegiance to the code of the United States of Vana. <laughs> 
Oh, you're so ready with that <laughs> character. It's great. This is a new thing because... Uh... Well, no, not <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, oh, my show. God. Do I sound like that? Oh, no. Oh, shit. Yes. What's happening? Quick, drink some water. <laughs> Quick. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, much better. Thanks. That's great. <laughs> you just now like I British sound... now or something? No, yeah. I sound totally normal. <laughs> <laughs> In this book, Kurt Vonnegut pitches four constitutional amendments. So let's look at his amendments and think about whether they are good ideas or not, right? Because, yep. like, he proposes some. In Chapter 45, he proposes a 28th and 29th Amendment to the Constitution. Amendment 28, every newborn shall be sincerely welcomed and cared for until maturity. Unenforceable, can't, can't use it in court, throw it out. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Amendment 29, every adult who needs it shall be given meaningful work to do at a living wage. Addend adult to read Michael Swain, and then we'll pass that one. <laughs> Amend living wage to be uh, grotesque piles of money. No, no. What do you think? Do you like them? Yeah, I, I, I can see like artistic reasons for the, them being unenforceable, uh, or at least phrased in a way that, like you say, they wouldn't stand up legally. I also think some of our existing amendments that applies to them too, like uh, either, either they're not enforceable or we've taken the text and then decided on an interpretation and we'll probably change our minds as we do. Yeah, that's true. So why not put in something like everyone should be nice? Because yeah. like we already put in stuff that used to mean something, but now it means whatever the current political climate dictates it means. Yeah. So why not put in everyone should be nice? <laughs> <laughs> All right, you sold me. Yeah, we should now, give them as, can, much, as much leeway as we gave, like, the Federalists. You if know? we can just attach a writer to get some but unwarranted again, the... subsidies to my constituents, I think this thing's ready to pass. <laughs> You're a district of one, oh, yeah. and we need it. Then in Chapter 52, he proposes two more amendments. This would be Amendment 30. Every person, upon reaching a statutory age of puberty, shall be declared an adult in a solemn public ritual, during which he or she must welcome his or her new responsibilities in the community and their attendant dignities. Yeah, I'll always take a bar mitzvah legally. Uh, yeah, I ordained. actually... I would love a manhood ceremony. I, well, adulthood adult, ceremony. Yeah, yeah. I actually think it's a great idea. Sure. Some kind of like secular national... Like how Thanksgiving is a secular national holiday right, right, where right. we're glad that we exist, you know? Well, there's quinceaneras and bar and bat mitzvahs, but you're, yeah, you're saying make a national one. Yeah. Like, adult American day. You became an American adult today. You have, Now you have these responsibilities. <laughs> yeah, if it, it would improve... All of our behavior, because then yeah. we would know at a certain time, oh, now I need to like officially get my act together. And it would resolve probably a lot of debates about like moral vice issues, like whether or not people are allowed to do, to drive, yeah. smoke, drink, join you the army. You get your first jury marry, summons. Join a jury, right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like we can pick an age and we if we had one age for everything, that seems like it would be reasonably sensible because you can join the army long before you can rent a car. You know what I mean? Like yeah, let's, thought, let's iron yeah. that out. <laughs> Amendment 31, every effort shall be made to make every person feel that he or she will be sorely missed when he or she is gone. I mean, and every effort, that's, that's utterly unenforceable. Utterly unenforceable. I, don't know, I don't know what that would mean. Yeah. We're trying it's to also, bring the deficit down here, Kurt. <laughs> <laughs> it's also like radically uh, caring and human and optimistic and heartfelt Aww. in a book where he is often completely yes. nihilistic and says right. most people should commit suicide. <laughs> yeah. So it's a, it, this book is all over the place uh, emotionally, which is an interesting way to be. Like, I think it speaks to where he was. Like it, You see him wrestling with his own pessimism really hard throughout, especially this later part of his career. Agreed. <laughs> yeah. um, He's a sad man who also believes in really beautiful forms of goodness so it's constantly a battle <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so it's interesting i don't know it's it's uh also the kind of thing where i feel like authors like vonnegut who are satirical or humorous opponents of them will get will peg them as like well they're just doing bits they don't actually have any solutions for anything like bill o'reilly would throw that at john stewart quite a bit like oh he just yucks it up while yeah. i actually cover the news and i'm a serious person uh -huh. so it's interesting to see vonnegut be like here's amendments this is what we should do boom yeah like sure you are bill solved constitution yeah sorry yeah. i brought up o'reilly <laughs> he's disgusting um <laughs> not a friend of the show we can move on i think to a, a next segment yeah right? Let's go on to a segment called Vana What? Vana What? Fun. Uh, what? Ding, 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 ding. 
ding a ding. And as you said, Michael, uh, I think this book's uh, surprisingly full of them. Surprisingly uh, full. And I say surprisingly just because I think as it's gotten later in Kurt's career, we've seen him be either self-aware or avoidance of what's more often. Yeah. And here he uh, uh, really doubles back, I think. Yeah. How many do you have? Because I have kind of a machine gun scenario forming <laughs> on this side. I've got a lot of them about women and uh-huh. at least one about what well, when i say women really gender and uh-huh. then uh something about aids and something about race uh-huh. riots uh-huh. all right uh, that's what jumps out to me all right let's alternate yeah <laughs> go ahead and then i'll machine gun and i'm gonna <laughs> explain real quick why it's a what and we'll move right on quote Corn on the cob steamed in seaweed with lobsters and clams. That's what they're eating at the clam bake, and he talks about how delicious it is. It is. Vonna what? That sounds terrible. <laughs> Vonnegut is constantly what? talking about terrible food in Cat's on. Cradle. They eat albatross canapes. Hold on. The things that pass for food in Vonnegut's mind are offensive to me. <laughs> He's eating albatross and like puffin meat and corn on the cob steamed in seaweed. It's offensive, Alex. Your turn. <laughs> Wait, that's like a bit though, right? Like, like I mean, I'm you're really not shocked and offended, but yeah. <laughs> I'm not offended in a political sense, but I'm I'm full of hate <laughs> for it. <laughs> yeah. All you right. take a corn on the cob, you wrap it in seaweed, and you steam it in a pile of crabs. Mm. Fuck right off. That now sounds I, awful to me. Have you ever? I uh, I'm I'm gonna go He's real. Gonna bring up paella, big league he? Hollywood on people. <laughs> uh, I had Indonesian food for the first time relatively recently, and they do a uh, the restaurant did a meal where it's all wrapped in a banana leaf, and they like yeah. steam it in the banana leaf. That's much better. And then everything cooks together, and it was yeah. amazing. So the seaweed thing I didn't bump on. I was like, oh, it's like that Indonesian place. Great. Well, what did you bump on, Alex? <laughs> my bumpy friend? But also, uh, seaweed might be gross. Anyway, um, <laughs> there's a few, a couple things with, I'll just extend it to gender. There's one part where he is talking about what he calls the only romantic story Trout has ever attempted to write. It's called Kiss Me Again. There's one quote from it, which is, there is no way a beautiful woman can live up to what she looks like for any appreciable length of time. And then he also says that the moral of the story is men are jerks, women are psychotic. And he and, doesn't just say it. He says it, and then all the fictional people in the book applaud and tell him you're as witty as Oscar Wilde right? for that line, for right. saying no beautiful woman can live up to what she looks like, which is a fucking skeevy thing that a creep would say. Yeah, <laughs> like he objectifies women, and then he, I think, tries to be like, all right, I'll equal opportunity offend both of the only two genders. Yeah, men are pigs. And I'll give men but the charge But bitches be of, crazy, yeah. Right, like saying men are jerks is very low level thing and then saying women are have a are full psychotic. on psychosis is like that's uh, so weird imbalanced yeah. <laughs> yeah women are full of hydrofluoric acid he said yeah and then he uh, uh, ca- just casually there's one part of the book where he talks about John Dillinger because mm-hmm. uh, that's an Indiana person so Vonnegut loves all Hoosiers and he says that um, there's the st- real story of Dillinger gets caught by the police because a woman he goes on a movie date with tips off the police and so they catch him coming out of the movie Vonnegut calls the lady a bitch and then uh, rips on her for being Hungarian like mm-hmm. he does an old there's a Chicago version of it with Polish people in particular but there's a lot of like old style of joke where it's like one kind of European ripping on another kind of European and yeah. he just like works in this like weird anti-Hungarian joke for no reason inside a misogynist thing. But also in the same bit he is lauding John Dillinger as like an all-time American Robin Hood type hero which I find problematic in and of itself because he was a criminal he killed at least he killed one cop during his uh, crime spree and when they shot him at the movie theater, it was because he pulled a gun and fired back. Yeah. So it's not like Philando <laughs> or something where you're like, this is a travesty of justice. Right, right. It was a guy who had robbed 24 banks getting killed in a gunfight with police. And Vonnegut calls Hoover, who is leading the FBI, the unmarried homosexual director of the FBI who simply executed him. And I'm like, no, he didn't. <laughs> and uh, who cares if he's unmarried and homosexual? What is that? Does that make Dillinger good? Because, you know what I mean? Yeah. It was just weird. I think his, like, 
love of John Dillinger is pretty weird. Yeah, I don't think he was really Robin Hood. And I don't even think Robin Hood's act. Like, if everyone <laughs> in society was Robin Hood, society wouldn't be tenable. Yeah, that'd be tough. I'm not even yeah. about, like, there being all Robin Hoods. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so that was a rough section where he just talks about how much he loves Dillinger. Yeah, and he calls her a Hungarian bitch because she turned him <laughs> right. in. Ugh. Yeah. So I bumped, and then there's also with gender stuff. He it's a pretty famous Vonnegut line where he calls semicolons transvestite hermaphrodites, and then uh, yep. he goes on to say that any scheme for laying out society that doesn't involve some kind of extended family for everybody might as well be a transvestite hermaphrodite. Uh, like repeatedly using all that kind of weird intergender. And I guess he's trying to make a like joke about weird. if yeah. you're of no gender, then cross dressing would lose meaning. But that's obviously misusing both terms, like hermaphrodite and transvestite. And it's a joke in poor taste at the expense of marginalized groups. And yeah. he repeats it several times. So yeah, it's, it's like, pretty weird. <laughs> but yeah, that's all my women and gender stuff, I think, that I remember. All right, here we go, then. I'm going to speed through. Feel free to interrupt at will. Yeah. Quote, nowhere on earth, save among the Watusis, did it make any sense for a woman to be that tall? Six foot two is the height in question. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. It describes weird. it as unfeminine or a huge he's... challenge for his sister to have been tall. Who his cares? sister, right, yeah. Quote, when we are gone, there won't be anybody sufficiently excited by ink on paper to realize how good it is. That's him telling Trout, who's also him, that once he stops writing, there won't be any good books anymore. <laughs> I just think that's unbearably smug. Quote, you want to know why I don't have AIDS? Why I'm not HIV positive like so many? I don't fuck around. It's as simple as that. Yeah, I bumped on that big uh, time. I think yeah. Freddie Mercury should rise from his grave and punch you in the face for that one, Kurt Vonnegut. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, uh, well, it's all, like by, by 97, I want my authors to be a little Empathetic for people who are AIDS. HIV positive, yeah. yeah a little, for little God's less sake. weird about it, yeah. It was way the hell and gone uptown amid nothing but people with lives not worth living for miles in every direction. Again, this keys into, I thought it was an amazing observation that he, his heart bleeds for people who, through no fault of their own, have such hard lives. But I feel like towards the end of his life, it's crystallized into a, a sort of elitism where he goes into a poor neighborhood and just assumes with a shrug, no one living in this neighborhood has a reason to live. And I think that's kind of an elitism that you don't really, you don't know them. You know, you don't know what they have yeah. going on. Yeah. Uh, he interprets Farewell to Arms as a story about how much of a relief it is to not have to get married after you fuck a woman. And he says Walden, the great Walt Whitman book about how beautiful nature is, was also about how great it is to not have to be around women. And I just don't agree with that interpretation. I think when? getting out into the woods and enjoying Walden Pond was not about getting away from his wife or whatever. <laughs> Right, well, it's uh, Walden's not by Walt Whitman. I, I'm sorry, I probably misquoted. Him. Fuck, who's I did misquote? I think Thoreau. Thoreau, but, Thoreau yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. it's Thoreau. You're absolutely right. Walt Whitman's but, leaves uh, the, the grass. But the important, <laughs> the important thing is, yeah, it's not just about like the important thing failing is on chicks. Walden like, was yeah. not about how nice <laughs> it is to go camping because you get a, a, some peace and quiet from the misses. Right. It was about how lovely nature is in and of itself. It wasn't gendered. Right. He wasn't Thoreau. Wasn't like a honeymooners character. <laughs> yeah, he wasn't like, like ugh. Yeah, like one of these finally, days, peace and quiet. Yeah. One of these days, Alice, I'm gonna go to a cabin. You know. Yeah. <laughs> this is fine to say. Women are beautiful. The naked form, whatever. But I question when he doesn't say anything else about women and he brings it up like it's necessary to bring up when he's 70 something at the end of a chapter. So at the end of a chapter, he says stuff about men, stuff about men, male characters, stuff about men. And he goes, and as for women, I must say, which I don't think is true. I still can't get over how they are shaped. And no matter how old I get, I will go to my grave wanting to pet their butts and boobs. And I'm like, that is funny. It's weird. <laughs> but yeah. why did you have to end a chapter to say like, oh, I've just been talking about men. I should mention women. Um, as far as women, to sum up the topic of women, I like naked women. It's like, who fucking cares? Like, was that pertinent <laughs> to your point? It's very minimizing. Yeah. Of the gender, not to say that you can't admit that you're a man and you're attracted to the naked female form, but bringing it up for no reason in the context of nothing, I find is minimizing to the whole gender. Yeah. I feel like if he wrote about women better or more three-dimensionally He or could have earned that, right? Yeah, I would have been fine with it, right. but I, I would have preferred in that 
since he doesn't, I would have preferred in that case if he was like, and also, obviously, I know it's weird that I'm still so fixated on their bodies when they're people. But uh, you And know, when he's like straight yeah. up Woody Allening it, like, right. we'll get to it. We'll get to it. Quote, I'm here to argue that the greatest writer in the English language so far was Lancelot Andrews. That's the guy who wrote the King James Bible. And I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, like did the translation, let it, yeah. But he would not be in my top 50, dude. <laughs> and he puts the text of the Lord's Prayer as proof. And I'm like, that's just so culturally unnuanced also. Like that the greatest writer in all of English speaking language would be some fuck. Like, like the Bible white translator. dude who wrote the bi- the most overwhelmingly popular version of the Christian Bible. It's just such a dumb, easy answer. And I will counter argue with text that he puts in this very book later on from Shakespeare's The Tempest. Okay, so the quote that he says proves that Lancelot Andrews, the greatest writer of all time, is, Yea, throughout, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. The Lord's Prayer. I think it's the 23rd Psalm, I think. Whatever. Yeah. That I super don't care about messing up. I believe Walt <laughs> Whitman wrote it. Um, but it is uh, it is beautiful. It shows great use of the language. Yeah. Um, but the message is very simple. There's no underlying symbolism and there's no epiphany. The only point is trust in God, this thing we say you should trust in. You will be rewarded. It will be good. There's no like deeper knowledge in it. And fucking in The Tempest, Shakespeare says... Full fathom five he lies, of his bones are coral made, those are pearls that were his eyes, nothing of him that doth fade, but doth suffer a sea change into something rich and strange. Infinitely more mysterious, beautiful, arresting, you can unpack it into deeper thoughts, still on the subject of what happens when you die, and I can't even tell if he was being sarcastic or ironic, because I just think that's a really dumb choice as best writer of all time. Yeah, it is weird, I... I, I feel like he earns it a little bit, but it takes a lot of, it takes some leaps on my part with assuming what he meant with well, it. Well, you would like, have to mean guy who wrote the thing that affects the most people for the longest. Yeah. Like, yeah, the Bible is very popular to read. I think you can go beyond that too with like that Psalm in particular, its meaning is a lot like you were sick, but now you're well again and there's work to do. Like oh, it's, that's true. Oh, everything's going crazy around you. Just, if, if you just keep going, eventually you'll, push through it and work through it. And yeah. so he's like giving that guy credit for Kilgore creating before Kilgore did. Sure. And to the entire Western world. Well, that's world, even you know? smugger to s- anyway. Yeah, I know. And that's to say that a, the thing yeah. that you're about to say is the greatest thing ever written by any writer. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, yeah. Well, and then, and the other way I think he gets away with that is he does, he is quoting two white men with Lancelot Andrews, which, what a white name. Uh, and also Shakespeare. Uh, but he also does quote, uh, I don't know if I pronounce it right, Omar Khayyam from the Rubaiyat. Yeah. He does bring that in too and, and with some a great bit of text about read, the moving finger writes and having writ moves on. Nor all your piety nor wit shall lure it back to cancel half a line nor all your tears wash out a word of it. One of my favorite poems of all time. Yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah. And it's so he he, he, find, he finds a, a non-white guy. Yeah, that's sure. something. I don't know. I'll give him that. Uh, I couldn't chronicle them all, but there's a lot of stuff like that where he's just getting old and crotchety. Like he talks about not being able to enjoy the novels of Willa Cather because all the characters are Czech immigrants. And I'm like, what? Your whole jam is empathizing with people different than you. Yeah. That's a really weird thing to say. Yeah, um, weird. Thinks, calls his mom useless. And then he defines that as she couldn't cook or clean or do all the things a mom should do. Yeah, that was useless of her. I don't. And he and he's been mad at her throughout all his writing too, which is just like yep. frustrating. Quotes: yeah. She was bug house. Face it, some women are. She wanted to be the whole show. Face it, some women do. Yeah. All right. Also, men. I like. Right. You could have just said some people go crazy. Why I just don't get the gendering, except I do, because as you just said, it has to do with his own life experience. Yeah. And the fact that his mom and sister both killed themselves, and of course he has to process that. And not, and not that it answers for it, but in another part of the book, he says, like, he quotes a relative who says that all the Vonnegut men are terrified of women, which right. he definitely is. Like, this is why he's being so uh, sexist. I think. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's not great. We talked about, he says, 17% of people have lives worth living and calls suicide the easy way out several times, which I just, uh, as we talked about last time, I quit drinking recently. Yeah, yeah. And had withdrawal period. That was, you get depression, goes with the territory, and it was a bad time to be reading someone you respect going like, oh boy. people should really just kill themselves. Like, honestly. No, I mean, like, yeah. really. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's, uh, 
unhelpful message to put out. You never know when someone's going to be reading that in their life. It's like that Netflix show, 13 Reasons Why. I'm like, eh, I don't know if this yeah. is good. Uh, I'm, I'm, and, gl I'm glad we have some space between those. Sure. And God bless you, Dr. Kevorkian. Oh, That's yeah. That's probably good. <laughs> and certainly don't like dogmatically call suicide the easy way out. I don't know. Yeah, that's not great. Yeah. Did you notice this one? He loves and heaps praise upon this guy who uses an ancient silk screening process that takes a lot of time to make his art. And he finds it charming that he's using an old fashioned technique that takes a lot of time. So charming that he invites him on the trip with him to try the beer and go to the art festival. And he gets to appear at the clam bake at the end, the guy who makes his silk screens as like a beloved character in the Vonnegut verse. Yet, there's another woman who serves his art similarly. The woman who has for many years rewritten his pages because he writes on a typewriter. She types it into Microsoft Word and fixes all the copy and stuff. Yeah. The only thing he says about her is she she doesn't use the latest software and so it takes her longer than it should. Maybe I ought to can her. Two times he says, I should probably just fire her. She's not invited to the clam bake and he doesn't yeah. seem to like her. And the only thing I can imagine is that he really finds it charming how the male dude is quaint and artisanal, and he f really finds it annoying how this broad can't get her shit together. I can yeah. only see it as sexist. I'm sorry. I didn't pick that up, but you're right. Yeah. Well, yeah, and, uh, and especially just him sticking to that. Not that he's enforcing a trope necessarily with one hire, but like just sticking to yeah. the thing of like women are typists and secretaries. Like, you know? He makes yeah. up a story about a kind of bird called a dollhousey where uh, ornithologists find the moms murdering the babies. Yeah. Not true. And I think it's just weirdly telling that he made up a random detail and it's that these moms suddenly murder their children. Right after that, he says, here's the story of Pandora's box. Pandora was given a box with everything in it. She opened it because she was a woman. Everything flew out, including hope. Hope flew away. I didn't make up that depressing story. The Greeks did. Uh, but in the original Greek story, every version I could find online, hope is maintained in the box. Yeah. So you did change the story in an incredibly crucial way to make Pandora seem way worse than she is in the original story. Yeah. And then you claimed no credit for it by saying that's the story, but you lied about what the story was. Then you immediately lie about what how the legend of Prometheus to arrive at the moral woman was their revenge. Like the gods hated that Prometheus brought us fire, so they created women to plague us throughout all time. And that is a side note in some versions of the story I was able to find. But by and large, most modern retellings of the Prometheus story do not arrive at the conclusion Pandora was created as a punishment for men because women suck to be around. But he right. really picks that out and highlights it and says, no, that's what the story's about. Don't you see? That is pretty strange. Yeah. Um, so he just has all these Freudian slips, I think, where it's like, yeah, you really have issues with female people. <laughs> he says it should be recommended that every neighborhood have a neighborhood bazooka that all the adults know where it is. I just disagree. I don't think that would work out well, given our current climate of mass hey, shootings. <laughs> don't We don't need bazooka control. I don't we know need. if he was uh, being serious, <laughs> but in case he was, I disagree. Yeah. He said that the only uh, group of people who didn't notice the time quake were the pygmy tribe of Mabutis in Zaire because their lives are so like road and repetitive anyway that it didn't feel like deja vu. Fuck off. You don't know how rich the inner life of an Mbuti tribes person is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> really speeding up here. Everybody agreed Monica's husband Zoltan Pepper was better off dead. What did he have to live for? And he says that because he was paralyzed from the waist down, his dick didn't work, and he couldn't be a composer anymore because there's a program that makes compositions. I can put myself in that mental space. I would still want to live. And I would yeah, resent people yeah. afterwards saying... Oh, it's good that he died because he was paralyzed. What right, the fuck? Uh, ableist, think, I think it's, it's called. It's pretty yeah. ableist. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they all agree that basically because he, he was paraplegic, it wasn't a big loss, which is fucked up. Yeah, it is. Some... They also, they, uh, in the book, Trout <gasps> turns because Pepper dies of getting squished by a vehicle against the doors of the building. And then uh, Trout turns his old wheelchair into a piece of sculpture on the river. Which is That's like, pretty weird to it's me. It's too soon, dude. Yeah, it's really odd. Um, like, it's not just like a prop for you. Like it was a guy's wheelchair. But it know? is like everyone in the universe thinks Zoltan Pepper is comical. 
because he was paralyzed. <laughs> yeah. And like the fact that he died is funny and you can make fun of his dead body immediately because he was just some guy in a wheelchair who died. Yeah. That's not okay. Yeah. <laughs> and he says about Zoltan Pepper, some people try as they might, can't cut the mustard. That's that. And I just disagree in a very fundamental way. There are so many ways to be important or like of use just to people around you, to the world at large, to nature. Um, you don't have to be smart. You could be nice. You don't have to be good at uh, moving money around. Yeah. You could grow a garden. You could be a park ranger. Like he tells an anecdote about his friend's son who's in football, a football player, and he comes home and his dad's like, why'd you get all C's? And he's like, don't you know, dad, I'm dumb. And then he says, yeah, some people just can't, aren't good and they should just give up on doing anything i'm like they just haven't found the thing for them i really yeah. believe that i really believe it's it's a very small number of people who are like not good for anything <laughs> very very <laughs> small as i yeah, tweeted like yeah. i bet bobby fisher sucked at high lie like i'm sick of these people who are like and i'm not going to argue kurt vonnegut can say like i'm the best writer of all time if you aren't the best of all time at something why even live and it's like well it's easy for you to say Right. I don't know. You could still grow a little garden, be good at cooking omelets. That's enough. You don't have to be amazing at everything to deserve life. Yeah, especially because I, I think in at one point in this book, he argues that everyone, when they go to a big city or a big university, will meet what he calls Mozart. Like, they'll meet the person who's even more amazing at what they do. Or naturally gifted at whatever right. they do. Right. So if that's the case, like people will be dying left and right if they should just die once they meet the better person. <laughs> right, yeah. Like, that's, that's a terrifying prescription. But also, of course, <laughs> that's not how life works because even if you literally met Mozart, there are some people who like Tom Waits' music better than Mozart and they can't elucidate why. Yeah. So if you were Tom Waits and you're like, oh, I should kill myself because it's not as sophisticated as Mozart, what about all the people who like Tom Waits' music? You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, art works like that. Almost through the what's... He has this horrible story where he goes on a walk to buy an envelope and he smugly tells his very patient wife, uh, I'm going to go buy an envelope. And she's like, why? And he's, and he's like, oh, you, you just don't get it. Buying an envelope is a deeply spiritual exercise. And, he's, and he says to you, the reader, she doesn't get it because she has a pager and a computer and all that garbage. She's not smart <laughs> like us. She doesn't realize the beauty of getting an envelope. Then he walks to a place to buy the envelope where he ogles the lady at the counter who he calls a Hindu, an honest-to-God Hindu. She even had a dot on her forehead. Isn't that worth the trip? All right, weird, 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 weird. I Doesn't engage yeah. her about her culture or anything. That's true. He just yeah. describes her as attractive and exotic and that it's neat to see her. I feel like there's like a positive version of that, but I think you're right. Fine. He's being he's being gawky and a but the story's exotic not way. done. That's not good. Yeah. <laughs> then he goes to the post office to mail the letter, and all he does is describe how the lady behind the counter is super hot. Yeah. He says her face is a Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> he says I lust after her every time I come here. It's why I come here. He says she's really really young. I'm really really old, and I don't care. I'll admit it. Like I want to fuck her, and he says. And with her, I would be happy. I wouldn't have to fake it like I do with my wife. His real wife, who he knows for a fact, will read this. Yeah, it's pretty... It's so weird. It's such a weird thing to write. It would yeah. be like me writing a poem called Dear Jennifer, Sometimes I Think About Fucking Someone Else. Like, <laughs> why did you write that? Even if it's true, which it's not, Jenny, baby. I love you. Yeah. But, like, why, would, why did you put that in a fucking book? Anyway. Well, and <laughs> it's also, like, in learning about his relationship with his second wife and wife for the rest of his life, Jill, it, it seems like they're there. It's the power was not kinda, equal. Well, it's yeah, it's concrete that she had an affair and then he found out in around 91 and he had affairs in his life too. There's no, no valid judgment on it, but they almost, they like lived separately for a while. He was on long Island for a year or two. And then they almost got divorced and then got back together and then stayed together for the rest of their lives. But it's not totally clear if they truly reconciled that or not, because you know, time alone doesn't heal something right. like that. You need to work through or, it. Or yes, and uh, or so, if it was always an issue, and maybe it was a snipe at her, and maybe he didn't care if this pissed her off. Right. You know? So like, because <laughs> like, he's seventy five, and he's like, be, "That's right." Sometimes I think about fucking the chick at the post office. How do you like that, Jill? <laughs> yeah. Well, like this is a letter of Vonnegut's, January nineteen ninety two. He's writing to Mark Leeds, and he says that. Um, 
I've been slow to answer your good letter of more than a month ago because my domestic life continues to be a shitstorm. My wife demanded a divorce, but then, as her love life failed to take the course she thought it would, she wants me back again. She thought she had another escort and meal ticket, but she was mistaken. Well, such a fucking sexist way to put it. Yeah. And oh, then, she thought she had her claws in some other guy, but I guess not. Yeah. Yeah. And they then, are uh, Lindsay and Tobias from Arrested Development trying uh, to kinda. cheat on each other. Yeah. <laughs> unable to find oh, yeah, anyone as good and being like, I guess I will settle for you because I, I suck. One. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and also then another letter, May of 1993. So over a year later, he's writing to Knoxberger, his longtime friend, and he says, For the sake of our darling adopted daughter, uh, Lily, now 10. Jill and I are not divorced. I am too old anyway for all the paperwork. Divorce has become as obsolescent as marriage. My son Mark is in the process of getting divorced, and as I've said to him, why bother? So based on his letters, it's possible that they stuck together and were never as close as they were again. They're just Which is very sad. Parents. It's a bummer. But it, it would explain why in his book he is openly saying he wants to fuck the post office employee. He also marries a character as his third wife. And just don't randomly. get me wrong, I'm even more <laughs> upset on behalf of the post office woman than Jill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, it's, what if it's she read that for someday and was yeah. like, shit, that's fucking me. This is creepy. Now when yeah. Kurt Vonnegut comes in here to mail shit, I'm going to have to take a smoke break. <laughs> and it's, it's a real bummer because in the uh, previous book, Fate's Worse Than Death, which is written and published right before Vonnegut finds all this out, like he leaves whole chapters to people writing about how great Jill is and, and how much he loves her and, and like birthday poems he had written for her. And so it's it's... Hard, we have no way of knowing because we're not those people if they ever fully reconciled, but they stayed together uh, through Kurt's death in 2007. So they, they made something work for a long time, and, and who knows if it was the same or not. Two more. Yeah. Uh, this is describing the crowd at the clam bake. He describes, like, he's like, as I said, Newman was there. Soup Nazi was there. The guy from Pendant Publishing was there. Quote, nobody was a double for Uncle Alex. He didn't like my writing. Oh, so someone didn't uh, <laughs> validate you enough in life. They don't get to be at the finale party. I think Even he's... though he's the one who said, if this isn't nice, what is? Which you've gotten a lot of mileage out of. A lot of mileage. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think a few times he's said that he showed Cat's Cradle to Uncle Alex. And Uncle Alex was like, like yeah, yeah, kids probably like this stuff. Yeah, but I love that <laughs> his punishment like... is he doesn't get to appear in the last book. Yeah. Well, he's and... intentionally snubbed. He's like, and Alex wasn't there. Suck on it, Alex. <laughs> but, and also, I feel like Uncle Alex saying, and I'm not just rooting for him because his name's Alex. Mm-hmm. Uh, Uncle Alex saying, kids probably like this stuff is like a pretty kind way to say something's not for you. Like, right. it's probably like, ah, I'm probably just too old. It's probably past right, me. Right, right. You know, yeah. like, you're much younger than I am. Your audience probably is too. Ah, they get it. And know? he's probably just ribbing him back. Give him a clam. Yeah. Let him come. Let him, have him eat a Piece of crab boiled in uh, <laughs> seal fat, whatever the fuck Seaweed. crazy <laughs> shit you eat. Yeah. No, but it's throughout the books, dude. Go back and focus on. Oh, there's a lot of that. Yeah, yeah like, like in the Lapagos, they cook it on the iguanas. Player piano, their like wonderful honeymoon meal is like two rare steaks, a pint of gin, and a gallon of milk. It's like, what are these people eating? It's all bizarre. Oh, yeah. And in um, which book? Dead Eye Dick. It's full of recipes. And I tried to make that cornbread, and it didn't work out. No, no. Like, yeah, Vonnegut foods are real hit or miss. Yeah. Then last but not least, he says, guess what? TV is an eraser. And I just think as an author... It's pretty short-sighted to condemn any whole artistic medium. And it's weird not to be able to see that all media is neutral. Um, Just like, I'm sure Vonnegut would not want this book compared to, oh, oh, it's a book? Oh, like Mein Kampf. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, just because they're both books doesn't mean they're the same. And he says, well, I've learned from my nephew Steve, who became a comedy writer, that in comedy he has to make timely jokes so that the bulk of the audience will be aware of whatever you're referencing. Yeah. That is true. We do that here at Cracked. I think it's quite a leap to generalize from that, that, as he says, TV, all it does is erase history and make people less literate and dumbed down. And if that were true, Ken Burns would not have a career. Like, a lot of TV is about enshrining history, false or true, and reinforcing stories and blah, 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 blah. My point is, obviously... I'm going to defend our medium as a comedian. (laughs) I think he just didn't like TV because it was new and scary. (laughs) Yeah. Same reason he didn't like the internet. 
And it's also, it's a little unfair of him to be like, ah, why would people do modern references in their stuff when like many of his books have a pile of modern jokes. Oh, like, I There's know. a whole chunk of Galapagos where the captain goes on Johnny Carson's show. Right. And which, if, like... What if we hadn't heard of Carson, right? <laughs> yeah. And I love that his example is, you know, I used to be able in speeches reference things like John Wilkes Booth assassinating Lincoln. Now I can't. No one's heard of it. I'm sorry. It's 2017. I can still comfortably go on stage and reference Lincoln's assassination. People yeah. still are aware that there was a president named yeah. Lincoln who was assassinated. His idea that, like, we're going to quickly become the people from Stargate where we have no culture, I just think is a little alarmist because he oh, was aging. Sure. Yeah. No, and there, there are certain things that I think writers and creators super, super have to avoid as they age. And one of them is... Royal astronomy. The, yeah, and all, well, and also the knee-jerk thing of... You see this in particular with jokes like, oh, my joke didn't play because uh, people just don't care about that thing anymore. That's why, like, no, maybe also maybe the joke didn't work. Like, you know, like. <laughs> right. Or the thing it, where, like, yeah, they think. You might not, have, might not have had the hottest joke about the Lincoln assassination. Right. Write a better I, one. There's a lot of older <laughs> comedians who are bemoaning that apparently life is so PC now right. that stand-up is not a viable art form because no one will laugh at anything. Yeah. And yet slightly younger comedians or comedians are more adaptable take Patton Oswalt's new special you see a room full of young people all laughing at every joke he found a way like you know what I mean <laughs> it's not it's just your limitation yeah. your style of comedy has gone out of style and you don't want to learn the new style because you're old or or even just you're under cooking your stuff like, right it's just like you didn't do or it you want to try less yeah. hard than you need to try to keep competing <laughs> right yeah and lots of people do it you know yeah it's okay Kurt it's fine. Maybe our longest. Sometimes that happens. Percentage-wise, probably the mo the biggest what section of any episode. This one, well, I like that we kept the plot short and have, have really d used the time to dig. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah. And uh, are those all, all the what's? I think that's about all the what's. I'm spent. <laughs> let's uh, then let's go into another diggy segment called the meat. Chop -chop -chop I said I'm spent, and that's what I meant. I can't talk about this content. Better be. Better be. Better be. Better be. I, better than the incense from before. I don't know. Just All trying right. to think of something. Lock her up. Lock her uh, up. Nope. Uh, <laughs> so let's, uh, as always, let's use the meat to dig into any other themes or thoughts that, that are worth like uh, deep diving on. Yeah. Do you want to explain the dirty joke? Because I have questions for you about the joke. Which dirty joke? The tingling joke. What oh, is yeah, it yeah, symbolic right. of? Because the central image is... Well, it, <laughs> so it's uh, the tingling joke is... The punchline comes from a man is hiding, but his uh, testicles are exposed and hanging down from the rafters. Yeah. And the lady tells a uh, policeman that, uh, oh, those are just bell clappers for like some kind of bell. And so the policeman's like, really? And he hits him and he doesn't hear a bell noise. And he's like, let me try again. He keeps hitting him. And then eventually the man in excruciating pain just shouts, ting a ling, you son of a bitch. Uh, which, and then throughout this one of book, Kurt's famously fine jokes <laughs> <laughs> that he loves so much. Yeah. And it, well, it, in this book, he gives loving that joke to Trout. And so Trout says ting a ling as a catchphrase throughout. And ting a ling also comes up in Jailbird. Is another yeah. Comes but it's in. cool in this because he clearly uses it as a fits all sizes word. Yeah. Like, uh, he'll say that he blames his grandfather for abusing his mother so much that she killed herself. Tingling, and you can tell that it means like "fuck you." And then other times, someone will go "howdy," and he'll go "tingling," and it means like "hey, how's it going?" So well, I, I actually I took one more specific thing oh, for yeah? it throughout, which for is sure. that it means you forced me, or life has forced me to give the response. So like when people are like "howdy," it's like, well, I have to say hi back, otherwise I'm yes. an asshole. Or like, oh, when I t when I sense I'm need to write you a book, I need to dive deep into all my pain. There it is, tingling. Like I did it. There you go. Which is a little bit of a, a crotchety thing to say, but I think it's a consistent meaning for the most part. But he does use it. There's times where he uses it, like how the Smurfs use the word Smurfy. I swear, like <laughs> unless I'm just That's totally reading true. into it. But there were times where I could tell what tingling meant, and sometimes yeah. it meant "Are you okay?" Sometimes it meant "Fuck off." Whatever, but I could just that's, be... No, that's probably true. That's probably true. Yeah. But I agree, and that's what I wanted to pull out, so I'm so glad you agreed. Yeah, it oh, ju good. I just yeah. thought it was a metaphor for conditioned response, yeah. Well, and I, I think and it's society in... will keep pushing until you give the response, no matter yeah. what. Yeah, and I think it's in keeping with also Vonnegut feeling like he is continuing to... If In this book, he kind of says that he's continuing to make art after 
he would be good at it and after he would enjoy it. Like even it, it, from the top being like Hemingway wrote the old man in the sea, like two decades younger than I'm writing this. Like, what am I even doing? Like mm-hmm. this book is a tingling. Like but the whole book, has to keep writing. The time quake itself forces you to. And of course, so the book's themes are like going through the routine versus being actually present in your life. Yeah, that's true. And there's so many times and that is done to great effect where it's like when I was in the army, I may as well have been in a rerun. But I yeah. wasn't really. So like, you, and then this guy who's in prison may have well has been. So there's times in your life that you relinquish free will, and the day you leave the academy or whatever, your free will is given back to you. And sometimes it's hard to shake yourself out of it and realize it's time to make a life decision. And if that metaphor is, I think, is mined really well. So like, what is a rerun? How is this rerun? If free will doesn't exist, then does it differentiate from a rerun? Like, if our lives really are predetermined, how is this not a rerun? What is free will? We don't have answers, but these are interesting questions. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the joke also brings up just the idea of going through the routine, even in spite of pain or not wanting to. Society forces you sometimes to go through the routine. He has to act like a bell because he is in the slot where a bell goes. Right. And he's a man, not a bell, but he has to be a bell right now. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Whatever. Yeah. (laughs) So it's a cool joke as a cornerstone of the book. Yeah, agreed. And 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 you're right. It is. It's. I think it is more multifaceted than I think I saw with just the one thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and yeah. similarly, he says on the same topic. I think, in real life, as during a rerun following a time quake, the people didn't change, didn't learn anything from their mistakes, and didn't apologize. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so it really just. There's a lot in the book about being present. I do think he was, he always resists it and says like, no, I didn't like that Zen Buddhist shit when I tried it. But I swear to God, he is a Zen Buddhist Um, because he's all about mindfulness and stillness. And I just thought that was the meat of this was notice when you have free will and exercise it with joy. And when you don't have free will, you don't or like recognize that you don't sometimes. Yeah, I think you're right. Well, with some past books, he's talked about transcendental meditation and how he felt like reading is his version of it and the actual meditation didn't do it for him. And I think, I think you're right that he has a Buddhist quality to him, but he just like, didn't see it as much because he did. He was like, Oh, I did the Buddhist meditation and it didn't do anything for me. I prefer reading. I must not be much of a Buddhist, but he actually is is. a Buddhist and just doesn't do all of the exact movements of a Buddhist. Puti wheat. So it goes. These are repetitive mantras. It's a very Zen Buddhist instinct. Yeah. The idea that he admires crocodiles and birds because their lives are being present all the time. Yeah. That is the Zen Buddhist goal. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Yeah, that's really cool. He just didn't mesh with whatever their thing was. <laughs> their their yeah. Tactics. He was like, I don't dress like them and right. do the same meetings, so yeah. I must not be a Buddhist. And I feel like but uh, you are, Kurt. Yeah, you are. That's the gristle I wanted to gnaw on. Unless you have more, but I also did want to point out, and I'd like people's opinions if they agree or disagree. I think a good obscure tattoo idea for Vonnegut might be blue mink bifocals, <laughs> which is the phrase that. Trout says to prove to himself that he has free will because it's something he's never said before in his life. Yeah. Um, So I like the idea of having a tattoo that people are like, what is that? And you're like, this represents the fact that I have free will and I have the power to like dictate the course of my life. It's a pair of glasses covered in blue fuzz. (laughs) That's a good mashup, I think. That's true. Yeah, his chosen nonsense is very uh, And you know me, I I want an obscure one. Like, I have no problem with the asterisk, but I don't want it because it's too obvious. I want something really (laughs) deep cut. Yeah, yeah. One, one, uh, it's unique. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. maybe. So what, weigh in on that, peeps. Should I get blue mink bifocals tattooed across my face? On the eyes? (laughs) Ah, (laughs) As glasses? (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) My only, my only other meat with this book is... And I'm curious what you think, but I think he should have gone ahead and written Timequake 1. I think he should have finished the book. Even if it ended up being like novella length and he's like, it's not long enough to, I don't care. Yeah. yeah, it was a good tight story that he could have separated out. Well, it also like that concept of a time quake is rich enough. I think you've got a whole book there and you can you can have all kinds of different things happen like here we basically get sort of like how hocus pocus a lot of the book is one day where eugene depp's heart is wandering through campus after he's been convicted and there's the trial before that with the university this is kind of one day where the time quake ends and the crash happens and they meet and everybody leaves town you know yeah it would make Uh, a great play just the plot parts not the essay parts yeah 
Oh, that's a great idea. And actually. I think if you, you separated out the plot stuff. parts, it would be roughly play length. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like or you, even you could adapt it easily. Because even well, and even Vonnegut's touchstone for older artists' last work being the Old Man in the Sea, like that's not a novel sized book. That's a novella, and it's as long as it needs to be. Well, and imagine and creatively using like on stage vignettes where, like, let's say in one part of the stage you see characters reenacting every physical movement of a scene they just did while the next scene is playing on the other side of the stage. Yeah. Like there's a lot of very theatrical ways to play with the deja vu and being trapped. Yeah. You could have someone living out a scene physically and then have someone doing the monologue of like inside they're screaming, they're trapped or what. Uh, we should have done playtime for this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. That actually, that sounds great. Well, and because also he, we're going to see Vonnegut in through the rest of his career, start to be more and more okay with fully experimenting yeah. with art forms. Like God bless you, Doctor Kevorkian was a radio show, right? You know, like really going for it. And he, I think he he spent so many years feeling like he couldn't get the novel out of this time quake that he wanted. And you see that in his letters. He keeps saying like, "I have a great idea that I'm not good enough to write. I have this time quake and I don't know how to do it." I think he ran into, "I have a time quake and I don't know how to do it," and said. Well, then it just can't be a novel, and it has to be this like hacked together thing. But that's when what's he could have just is... been like, "Oh, I'll do a different form." Great. Also, all the pieces are there. The novel is there, or I don't get it. There's no missing plot points. Yeah, it would have been a short novel, but he could have just. I could copy and paste together a novel without all the essays in it. Yeah, it would be it like be eighty pages long. Write the rest of what's it. What's wrong even. with that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, because I, especially having. But see, I think there's some... That, sorry. Yeah. Well, ju just finding that when he was like, how do I stitch it together? I repeat all my essays. That's not the most satisfying way to do it to me. Maybe, but I'll, I'll rush to his defense. I think Time Quake, as I said at the top, is a uniquely structured experiment in literature. Yeah. So it wouldn't be if you separated out the novel and made a traditional novel. So, yeah, so yes, the part of me that is more at home in slapstick Galapagos, like in the world, I wanted it to stay in the world. Like, yeah. I just started playing the new Assassin's Creed game. People will know oh. what I'm talking about when I say... Is that the Egypt one? Yeah, you're Egypt, and it's beautiful and awesome. And every time you come out of Egypt world and you're just a lady in a room at a computer, you're like, just get back in Egypt. <laughs> like, that's how the essays <laughs> felt. And uh, But at the same time, well, in Assassin's Creed, it adds nothing. But in Time Quake, I feel like the bizarre structure did add kind of a feel where you're like, this does feel all time quaked up and jumbled up in an interesting way. And even though I agree with you that there's a novel in there that would have been a more satisfying novel, it was interesting to see him do a structural experiment he hadn't done before. And he did a yeah. good job. Yeah, yeah. No, there, there is. That's fair. There's something there. Yeah. I do. I, I almost feel like a time quake one, he still could have made himself a character, but just much more straightforwardly. Yeah. Like th that could have been a way to. But as he said, it. he's like reaching the twilight of his years. So maybe he just couldn't be bothered to add the extra effort yeah. that a younger writer would have to like just burn it and start over and break it again. He's like, I really want to just wrap it up. I respect <laughs> that. He's written plenty of good books. He can pop yeah. it in. Yeah. No, it's, yeah, I'm not like <laughs> mad at him. I just, I, I, as I read it, I was like, I can see it. I can see the, yeah. the the other book. Well, I don't know. I know you're busier than me these days, but I'm still down to try and do some one acts or something after the run. Oh yeah, yeah. and yeah, we could too. even release the audio. Would be great. Maybe we should do a time quake short play of time quake. That would be pretty cool. I mainly want to do yeah. Euphio question or the Barnard principle. I mean, the Barnhouse effect. Yeah, Barnhouse yeah. effect. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. As a monologue at a desk to audience where the audience slowly realizes the person giving the monologue is compromised. Yeah. That's as really narrator cool. is so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we gotta we gotta do that. Send us our send us encouragement. That'd be yeah. Great. Yeah, yeah. Demand that we make a play and we will. <laughs> And uh, I think we can move to another segment from I this am meat. stuffed with meat. Oh, delicious meats. Let's go to a segment called Kurt Vonnegut Grades. Ooh, I got those meat sweats, you know? Oh, no, but it's the, the day of the cold test. cold meats. But it's the day of the test. It just Grades. smells like hot dogs School. everywhere now. <laughs> <Ugh>. <laughs> I like that your Vonnegut Grades intro this week is just meat discomfort. Mm -hmm. Like, just like intestinal. This is, uh, we in the past few books we've run into... The fact that Kurt's list of grades from Palm Sunday, where he grades himself relative to himself, runs out. However, with Timequake, uh, we have some interesting timing with when this book came out, because it came out in 1997. But in 1996, they were releasing a movie of Mother Night. 
that was happening in the world in the fall of 96. And the so, McNulty one we have covered on the podcast, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. And so Vonnegut does a bunch of press in the fall of 96 as he's finishing this book. And so he talks about the book a lot. Mm. And he went on Charlie Rose and said explicitly, like, yeah, one time I graded all my other work. And this book that I'm in the middle of writing, I'd give it like a B minus. And Charlie Rose was like, really a B minus? He was like, yeah, and for an old guy, that's not bad. You know, a B minus, yeah. And we'll, we'll link off to it. But yeah, there's an yeah. interview where he mostly talks about the Mother Night movie. And then Charlie Rose is like, are you working on anything else? And he's like, yeah, I, I'm finishing up a book. He also, Vonnegut also says that he is finishing the book because he owes Putnam, his publisher, one more book, <laughs> which is sure. very dark. Uh, yeah. But yeah, he uh, he says like, ah, this one's a B minus. Yeah, it's only a Northern Song kind of deal. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Before you, I didn't know that, but that's my grade, B minus. So dead on, yeah, I agree. I also, I, I didn't put that in the doc before, so sorry. Oh, um, well, I've yeah. so far disagreed with him almost every time, but I think that's pretty accurate. Yeah, that, yeah. yeah. I think I think I, I would, would. The straightforward novel version probably would have been a B plus. Yeah. This version's probably B minus. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I would give this one a C just because ah. I'm, uh, but it's, a lot because of my own perspective, having already read a lot of the essay type sentiments recently, especially in our previous episodes. So they're very fresh. Um, and, right. Like when you reach also, a killer quote, it's hard to give him the same amount of blown away credit that you gave him the first time you read that killer quote. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> and it does. And it has a couple amazing germs of things in it. So it's not like a disaster or anything. And it's worth a read. But uh, but I can I can see the stronger book. And, and I've come across a lot of this before. Oh, it's definitely worth a read. Yeah, someone commented, and I don't blame them, on the Facebook page about Fate's Worse Than Death. Oh, after listening to the episode, I'm glad I skipped it. It sounds like just a totally missable cash grab. I still want to stress that it's like a, the worst Coen Brothers movie is still better <laughs> than 87% of all movies. Yes. Like yeah. Lady Killers is still better than your movie, whoever you are. Yeah. Um, and I feel the same way about Vonnegut. So when we say something is like a C-, minus. It's still not like a missable cash grab. Right. I wouldn't characterize it that way. There's still insights in it that are some of the wisest shit you ever heard. It's just that he said it before in other essays, so we're not as impressed. <laughs> 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 but like no no book we've covered is like you shouldn't read it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, it's it's definitely were it worthwhile and especially especially certain things in it like um like you were sick but now you're well again and there's work to do yeah it's one of the best things he's if ever you went done. by the same rubric as movies like was like, it worth the time and money to have experienced it i'd say yes in every single case of every book we've covered yeah same. Yeah. yeah yeah there's no vonnegut book that you'll read and be like i want my four hours back <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they're all so quick. Yeah. Is it bro? Unless you're an idiot. Uh, <laughs> well, speaking of books and their relative quality, let's go to another segment called Related Reading. Isn't that the Related Reading yeah, message? Yeah, I, I think. think it's that. Yeah. I hope it lines up. Or it, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> it's some, like, death metal thing, and we're just whistling Yeah, like it. that was the one from Plot Time, just completely <laughs> misplaced. It might be. I don't remember it by heart. Yeah. <laughs> Let's uh, pick out some other works and, out and things that you. remind us or fit with this book. You, you, you. Yeah. I have four. They're, I have five. They're all plays. <laughs> They're all plays? Yeah. Oh, wow. Cool. All mentioned in the book. I have no plays. Okay. Uh, and then, and I have four. One of them is The Old Man in the Sea. But for mm -hmm. ju it's, mm -hmm. he is justifiably Walt bringing Whitman's it up at the beginning. Walt Whitman's finest work, Old Man <laughs> in the Sea. Very good. Yeah, but it is, it's, it really, it's like an author writing about, in part, all of his previous works, and also doing so in a late in life shorter piece, and, and it's all, it's great, it's great. Yeah. What's funny about that short story, or novella, I think it's way more meaningful if you take it literally. Like, I don't care about the plight of a oh, rich sure. author who's sad that their most recent book is not as beloved by critics. Oh, sure, sure. I do deeply empathize and think a lot of things about life and death and futility. If it's literally an old fisherman who, yeah. who gets this amazing catch and then has it all eaten by sharks by the time he gets back to shore, that's a better story than Hemingway bitching about his career. No, that's true. <laughs> it does. Yeah, it does also. It has that actual textual value yeah like i i think it means more to me for hemingway than time quake does for kurt vonnegut yeah like as, as in my reading of them you do all yours mine are super fast okay this is uh i want to pick out another saunders thing uh, that is george saunders is lincoln and the bardo it's his novel of this year 2017 it won the man booker prize uh, it doesn't need a prize to be great 
And I didn't remember that Timequake almost had a bunch of Lincoln stuff in it and a bunch of Lincoln stuff that I think would have tried to speak to who we've always been as a country and who we are as a country right now. And Lincoln and the Bardo is incredible in a lot of ways and partly because it speaks to that, like the question of in order to be a country, what do we do? Like, do we take care of each other? Do we let each other fend for ourselves? And uh, it's also very, very experimental in the way this one is. Like, it's a lot of voices in a bardo, which is a Buddhist, oh, a Buddhist stuff, great. It's like a Buddhist space where you your soul goes to at one point. And uh, so it starts from those voices at a point in Abraham Lincoln's life. And, and it's it's just amazing. It's great. Nice. And it's also like funny. Ivana gets funny and so Saunders. Next one, I, my, I think also a lot of my related readings are authors doing a certain thing better than Kurt Vonnegut did it in Timequake. <laughs> uh, like I think Saunders nails Lincoln in a way that uh, Vonnegut Ooh, didn't when he started to. Oh boy, sorry. Uh, anyway, uh, it, it was a long time ago. Now, I want to pick out a stand-up special that's also a one-man show. It's called My Girlfriend's Boyfriend, and ah, it's by Mike Berbiglia. Berbigs. And Vonnegut picks back over his own life throughout Timequake, and I think he repeats himself a lot. And Berbiglia on that special, he does an amazing thing where he, his previous special or two were entirely about his own life. And they were entirely stories from his own life structured in an incredibly meaningful way. And I remember watching those and thinking like, he just talked about his whole life. What does he do next? Like he's screwed. And my girlfriend's boyfriend, you get to see him continue to find new stories from either events he's talked about, but mostly events he hasn't talked about before. Like it's somebody who is a master at mining their own single life for an incredible number of stories mm -hmm. and events and, and experiences. Nice. And he's very funny. And yeah, it's, it's like, he's, it's funny. He's the guy who's doing like storytelling shows with as many jokes as a comedy show or comedy shows with, with as much meaning as a storytelling show. He's great. And then a uh, last one is a book called born standing up. It's by Steve Martin. Mm -hmm. And this is it teaches you the banjo, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> it's all banjo. It is a yeah. learn at home by mail banjo course. <laughs> they actually, my I just watched it two days ago. My mom sent me a, a their Steve Martin's group, him and the Steve King Rangers. They did right. a NPR Tiny Desk concert. Yeah. It's a good time. But Sporn Standing Up is an artist looking back at his entire life. And Steve Martin, I think, does a uh, better job. They don't all need to be better than Kurt, uh, but he does an amazing job of writing a fully fleshed out piece of literature. Like, it's not just a celebrity blogging their own mm -hmm. stuff. Like, he examines his entire life in a very, like, almost clinical way, but also very heartfelt. And it's really, really revelatory and really cool. Yeah. yeah. And if uh, you, yeah, like, right. do comedy or like comedy, it's a, it's a really fascinating thing. Yeah. yeah. I also really like Cruel Shoes by him, which is the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> There's Cruel nothing in time. it. You can read it and not understand anything about him at all. <laughs> well, yeah, same it's, way. Yeah. His, his uh, plays kind of range that way, too. Like Shop Very Girl experimental play, feels yeah. like it's a lot about himself. And his Picasso at the Lapina Gilles is yeah. just like stuff. It's yeah. really interesting. Yeah. This time, I'm putting all my weight behind convincing you to read plays. Because yeah. it's too expensive to go see plays. Oof. And they don't do the best plays very often near you. <laughs> <laughs> and they're quick reads, and they're super, super good. So I recommend you read all the plays he mentioned in this book being good plays, because they're all plays I've read. Oh, cool. And some have seen, but mainly I'm saying, even if you can't see it performed... I read these plays by just reading the words and still very much enjoyed them. So plays are worth reading, and the ones he mentions in here, Our Town by Thornton Wilder is mentioned repeatedly. Arthur Miller mentions both Death of a Salesman and The Crucible, and Tennessee Williams, A Streetcar Named Desire, and Glass Menagerie. And I'll just give sure. my stamp of approval to all of those. They're all things like classics where you're like, oh, I have to read War and Peace because it's War and Peace. But these ones are super fun and good. Like, all five of those are really engaging and entertaining and short. Yeah. And still very relevant, not dated. Like the human themes are punchy and they're good plays. That's Our Town, Death of a Salesman, Crucible, Streetcar, and Glass Menage. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, those are all, and they're all like. Uh, you already know they're good because society plays said of... they are. Yeah. <laughs> no, like, yeah, if you picked like a landmark plays of American theater, those five would be in the first like 10, anybody would say. Yep. Easily. Yeah. yeah. 
and and yeah, they're amazing. Yeah, he also uh, there's a, at one point he talks about the writers' retreat at Xanadu, and there's four suites named after writers, and then Trout's like, all those guys died of alcoholism. Mm -hmm. Ah, hilarious. <laughs> um, and one of them's Eugene O'Neill, who I think is also worth a read if we're talking about plays. Totally. Yeah, I um, trust you. I haven't read an O'Neill. <laughs> oh, it's I mean, Long Day's Journey into Night is like a. Mm. a Gut ripper. Sure. Yeah. He 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 writes a lot of th those plays where it's like just real viciousness among yeah. people, but but in a, a human way. And yeah. Anyway. Yeah. We would usually do a Vonnegut news segment, but there's oh. not really any particular news. I guess that's good news. Things are chilled out. So goes yeah. the old saying. It's a <laughs> it's a very calm Thanksgiving time in the Vonnegut world, unless something happens like between the couple days between now and when this comes out. But I think that wraps up our Time Quake episode. Eat your turkey, scar your children, drink your port, do do your thing. Wait, scar your children? Do your Thanksgiving thing. <laughs> what? <laughs> you didn't get deep, abiding emotional scars at Thanksgiving? <laughs> no? Not usually. All right. I guess my life is a crock of shit. We watched, <laughs> we watched Detroit Lions football games. and uh... Oh, see, we watch old home movies of like our elementary school plays, and our parents point out our flaws and like, where we messed up. <laughs> then they make us do the scenes again and see if we can get through it without fucking up in their words <laughs> or quote unquote shaming the family yeah you know that explains why you like our town so much oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i've i've had to play every single part <laughs> just to get stuffing <laughs> <laughs> i just want stuffing <laughs> and they're like then feel deeply for the loss of your town okay but i'm hungry <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, as far as programming notes, we're, mm -hmm. we're figuring out our next few episodes. Somebody messaged us when we when you said, like, hey, the next episode is Time Quake. And they were like, does that mean you're done? And like, it's the last novel, but there's more Kurt Vonnegut writing. Yes. You've got more to go. He also he had a very big 1999. So our next episode is Bagambo Snuffbox, written, mm -hmm. uh, published in August of 1999. And after that, we're doing God Bless You, Dr. Kevorkian, published October of 1999. Mm -hmm. So what a Clinton Years festival we've got coming <laughs> yeah. up. It's going to be great. And with that, thanks for listening to this episode. Thank you. Have a, as Michael said, do all the Thanksgiving things, in particular harrowing family drama. Yep. And if this isn't nice, what is you? <laughs>